Hi, welcome back. I'm Dan Grushkin, Executive Director of the Biodesign Challenge. You are watching day two of our summit. This is Alex Kozalewski, our Communications Manager. Hey, everyone. Uh, welcome back. We're so excited to be on day two and see some more amazing projects. Uh, just a few reminders for anyone joining us for the first time. A quick explainer of what you're going to see today. Since we can't be in person uh, for presentations, we have asked each of our teams this year to create a short video to explain their project. Uh, they range between five and 10 minutes. Uh, and then after we show those to the audience, we're going to call those team members up to the virtual stage to speak with our judges for a Q&A and uh, to explain a bit more about their project. Uh, if you missed yesterday's broadcast, you can also watch all those videos that were that were presented on our BDC website, on our participating school pages. Um, and then lastly, a few community reminders. You can engage with our Miro board, uh, answer a few questions about uh, what you like to read, some resources, join our mailing list, um, tell us what your favorite food is, because it's kind of food themed this year. Uh, it's, a, it's a lot of fun, you should check it out. Uh, and then we're also doing a community choice prize uh, so everyone can vote for their favorite project. Uh, you can cast your ballot on our BDC Summit website. Uh, there's a link there. Hopefully, if you're voting, you're watching the projects as well. Uh, and lastly, please do tag us on social media. If you're tweeting, Instagramming, Facebooking, whatever it is you do, uh, tag us at Biodesigned so we can start a dialogue with you. So. Thank you, Alex. Um, last reminder, I've just I've been tasked with letting everyone know that yesterday we launched our Kickstarter video for our book. This is our first ever BDC book. It's a comp compilation of student projects from the last five years, uh, as well as voices from some of our experts. It's a good read, I promise. I've been working on we've been working on it for over a year. There are over 100 contributors. Uh, please do check out the Kickstarter and buy a book if you'd like to, or promote it on social and get your friends and family to buy books as well. Okay, well, yesterday we saw a multitude of projects that explore the future of biotech. Today, we're gonna be doing something similar, of course. Um, this morning, we have two teams that are both eligible for our top prizes, but also for our sponsored prize, Barilla's uh, Prize for Regenerating Living Ecosystems. Um, we have been really blessed and thankful to be working with Barilla this year, uh, exploring what food might look like in the future. And I just want to thank Michaela Petronio and Anna Rosales from Barilla, who are here today as judges as well. Thank you, uh, Michaela and Anna. So without further ado, we're going to get right into the team presentations. And so uh, the finalist teams for the uh, Barilla Prize are SAIC, School of Art Institute of Chicago, and Rochester Institute of Technology. So let's see their projects, and we'll get started with SAIC. Thanks, everyone. According to city records, less than 9% of plastics thrown out in Chicago are recycled. The uncomfortable reality is that most of our plastic waste does not have a sustainable life cycle and ends up a permanent blight in landfills and as microplastics. Our unrecyclables are closer to us than an exported problem. This map shows the density of active landfills in the U.S. and Puerto Rico. This is a landfill located in Zion, Illinois, slated to close in 2027. You can notice the trucks for scale. These are massive mountainous heaps of buried trash with dangerous health repercussions, including leachate and off-gassing. Incineration of these plastics has the immediacy of climate change acceleration by emissions. What if our single-use materials were not eternal? Designed with a regenerative life cycle, Permapack Biopolymer is a marine and waste stream solution that does not extract land resources. Our project foregrounds compostability and the circularity of permaculture ecology. We look to proteins and polysaccharides made in the cells of plants, mycelium, seaweed, and insects for a biologically degradable solution with scalable ecology. When searching for a market application for kelp farming, a critical tool in carbon fixing against the climate crisis, there couldn't be a more pertinent market. 
How many bags do you pass on a daily walk? Plastic films and poly bags are responsible for the lion's share of environmental pollution. 46% of ocean plastics, non-recyclable leakage that never makes it to the landfill. Permapack's hybrid biopolymer is a vision of degradation as enrichment and market popularization for a seaweed-based climate solution. Bioplastics on the current market claim shorter life cycles but must be industrially degraded, an energy-intensive process under high pressure. Unlike seaweed cultivation, starch-based feedstocks compete for land and freshwater resources for food production or require further clearing of land. It encourages monoculture and inequitable land disenfranchisement at odds with sustainable permaculture. Starch-based bioplastics shortfall us in their brittleness, requiring majority constituent additives which counteract degradability. The outcome is energy-intensive industrial degradation. We lack the sorting infrastructure to execute or microplastic pollution. Conventional agar bioplastics and biotextiles suffer too from the problems of shrinkage, lack of stress integrity, and moisture regulation, which sometimes grows mold. Our hybrid polymer purposefully incorporates mycelial chitosan and antimicrobial silk cocoon protein to eliminate these contingencies. Dissatisfied with the questionable degradability of bioplastics and with paper products relying on deforestation and water-intensive energy-emissive processing, we designed a minimally processed permaculturally degradable material. A regenerative chitosan source unconstrained by region, season, or agribusiness practices of global aquaculture is discarded mycelial biomass from citric acid production. The fermentation of Aspergillus niger for citric acid yields 80,000 tons a year of discarded mycelial biomass, which is a more sustainable source than crustacean shells. Worldwide production of agaricus mushroom leads 50,000 metric tons per year of mycelial waste, and pleuritis is becoming an ever-important packing and building material. Given that our formula only uses about 8 grams of chitosan per square meter of biopolymer, the immense amount of chitosan in the growing mycelial waste stream encourages us to imagine circularity at scale. Saracen is a crucial element to create the flexibility and tensile strength of our novel biopolymer application. Saracen is a serine-rich protein found in the cocoons of silkworms that is extracted during silk degumming and treated as wastewater. For short-run scalability, we propose a regenerative system of mulberry tree propagation for sericulture that utilizes the shed chitin of silkworm growth cycles, with feed and bedding waste composted by vermiculture into fertilizer for more mulberry trees. In this cruelty-free system, the silkworms would be reared for the completion of their life cycle and not culled for fiber. For long-run scaling, we propose the microbial synthesis of sequenced saracen. We have discussed the logistical leap with a synthetic biologist at Rowan University, and our professor, Dr. Andrew Scarpelli, has proposed connecting with colleagues at Northwestern Center for Synthetic Biology for this collaborative effort. We are also consulting with UIC civil and materials engineer Matthew Daly on performance testing. We have extracted the advantageous properties of the silk protein like its polymeric strength, resistance to oxidative degradation, antibacterial qualities, and moisture retention. In ongoing control tests, our heat-sealed biopolymer packaging performs comparably to its petrochemical competitors, polyethylene products such as saran wrap, cereal bags, and other single-use consumer plastics. A 10-day control study test with tofu showed no visible signs of moisture loss or mold growth. We continue to test with other produce. Its most impressive performance has been its tensile strength and high tear resistance. It laser cuts superbly for pattern making and can be sewn. Best of all, it decomposes in a worm bin or garden compost. With Permapack, we see within reach a synthesis of marine forestation waste stream utility, accessible home compost degradation, and local food sovereignty for our near future. 
What's next? We are working to demonstrate soil and marine biological degradation under conditions in natural environments. This means respirometry tests, germination analysis, and microscopy for microparticles after breakdown. The vast majority of consumers do not have access to home or industrial compost facilities, so we prioritize biodegradability in real-world conditions. Material innovation is the solution focus because of the high-volume, low-value niche in replacing thin-film plastics. We are expanding the rigor and range of our applications testing. In addition to this, we're expanding the range of our digitally fabricated molds for casting, injection molding, and vacuum forming, including a self-sealing closure. For ongoing social engagement, we've been sending samples to artists and designers, producing a video survey of how they imagine the future ecology with materials to be. And we're also building an open source repository site of biomaterials research and best practices. Unwrap the future with us. Welcome back, everyone. We're here with the Permafact team. Judges, let's get started. Do you have questions? Go ahead and turn on your videos. Great, Michaela, you're on. Yep. Thank you. No, it's great presentation, actually a lot of work. Uh, and I understand it's really seems to be like uh, super exciting, very complicated. And so I have a question on, uh, first of all, congratulations, because I mean, you, I mean, you really, I mean, uh, brought so many solutions into into one. So first, first question is about how did you get to this like magic formulation? So where did you get the inspiration? And I mean, there are a number of sources. So why this specific uh, formulation or mix of natural uh, ingredients? Second question is, um, which would be your first application? So you showed the pictures of products that are sold fresh, such as tofu, that maybe could really face many challenges as opposed to shelf-stable and dry products. So. Uh, which would be your first go-to-market product? Thank you for your questions, Michaela. Um, I can speak a little bit about our process. Um, it's actually not that out there. Um, there's a rich archive of biomaterials research because nature makes the same, you know, building blocks, you know? Um, we went into a lot of hydrogels research also um, when we picked out saracen specifically and um, our research into like waste stream uh, products uh, really helped us optimize our formula as well like i feel like we chose our ingredients specifically for like scalable ecology reasons um, and um, as far as your question about uh, what would be our first line for product um, since it holds up well to both moisture and dry goods. Um, I have our pasta pack with us right now. It's hard to see because of my virtual background and the keying, but um, yeah, uh, for that, I would suggest maybe like different thicknesses um, since we've been casting and experimenting with a variety of different digitally fabricated molds i would say um, to get like a high strength um, and high water resistance low permeability um, to protect these uh, goods that are sensitive to um, moisture exposure um, we would use the thicker um, weight of our material. And for our more like saran wrap like applications, sorry, uh, I know it's hard to see. Um, I would use like our more thinner uh, materials that still have demonstrated very uh, high like uh, water resistance, but also moisture retention in that it doesn't shrink or structurally change. And it holds up well in our control testing uh, with the tofu. Um, yeah, that would be like the saran wrap like um, applications where you really want like a cling like seal 
and um, it also keeps out the moisture. So that's the advantage in that. Uh, Saracen, the protein brings in a lot of great properties of um, not only high tensile strength performance and moisture retention, but mainly antimicrobial properties. And that's what we're very excited about. Thank you. Jean. Go ahead, please. Hi, um, thank you for your great presentation. I just have one question or, or, or something I want you to speak to. Between the sort of chemistry and the mold, what was the behavior of the material? What did the material want to do? Did it flow into a mold and kind of slump? Did it, was, did you have to press it in? Were there any conditions that the material made um, that is something you should pay attention to? It's basically what I'm interested in. Thank you for that question, Jean. Um, so it's a liquid solution is what we're currently working with um, for both pore casting and injection molding. Um, and the behavior of um, our hybrid biopolymer is very like charged because of the hydrogen bonding interactions that happen between chitosan. Um, it's a very charged molecule, especially the fungal chitosan. Uh, and um, it, behaves like um, it, we're using like nonpolar surfaces currently in our molds. Um, and it wants a lot of surface contact with the mold um, is how we minimize the shrinkage and its uh, exposure to the air. And I think the strategy going forward when we're expanding beyond um, our sheet molds when we're um, working with injection molding where it's going to be a 3D uh, form uh, is to maximize the surface area contact during curing because that's when it's most sensitive to any kind of deformation because it really wants to hydrogen bond to itself. That's where we get its advantageous properties. Um, we looked at a lot of research for um, this soil protein isolate film that could be interesting. It's a little bit misleading because they market themselves as a vegan spider silk when it has nothing to do with spiders. The only um, aspect that is related is when spinnerets, when the uh, protein slurry solution is ejected from the spinnerets, um, there's a drop in pH that causes the hydrogen bonding to uh, fold the protein in a different way, in a more, um, tight like self way. So we really want to like emulate that process too um, with electro spinning. Okay. I have one more question. How long did it sit in the mold from pouring it cures, to demolding? Um, so it depends on the thickness it's poured, the size of the mold. Um, for a 500 milliliter pour to make four square feet, it takes two days to cure. And if it's a smaller surface area, it's within a day or less. Depends on size. Carrie, I'm going to do one last question. I know people are jumping in. Oh, she. So go ahead. Make, but it, it should be a quick one. Okay. Um, I have a quick clarification question from you. So, so you said that you want to use sericin from the waste stream, um, which sounds great. Um, but then you also said suggested that you want to maybe create a completely new cruelty free system in which the silkworms aren't harvested. So I, I just like some clarification there. Um, and then just briefly, do you envision any competition with the use of sericin with the medical industry? Because I know that um, the medical industry is using a lot of this for like bandages and things like that. And where do you where do you see that sort of intersection happening or competition? Thanks. Thanks for that question, Carrie. Um, in address to competition, I think it's great that they want to use um, a waste stream ingredient and the more people making it, whether it's for the medical industry or for like the more pervasive behemoth of like single use plastics, I think it's very exciting. Um, that people are interested in it, but it's important, you know, to have the ecological and, you know, socially ethical considerations of it being a no kill system. And that's why we think the future is in the microbial synthesis of sericin. But, you know, you have to have your like short term scale and then your like, you know, five year and then like what's within reach um, in, in your steps to scalability. And that's why we are proposing this like 
permacultural um, in, permaculturally informed no kill system of mulberry tree propagation. Um, yeah, sorry, I know we're out of time. Perfect, we're out of time. We're gonna move on. That was wonderful. Thank you, Permapak. Thank you for the questions, judges. Uh, next up, we have RIT, Rochester Institute of Technology. Milk has become a staple of every household, with over 200 billion pounds produced in the U.S. last year. But the waste that follows has become a global issue that few consider, yet all are affected by. In the United States alone, 84% of people throw away food simply based on the date stamped on food packaging. And dairy products are the number one food category disposed of due to sell-by dates. It is estimated that one in six pints of milk are discarded worldwide with up to half of all dairy waste occurring in the home. If these numbers aren't alarming you, then perhaps the toll that dairy waste has taken on the environment will. Due to the rise of mega dairy farms, average milk production per farm has increased 12-fold in only three decades. As a result, improper disposal of milk, both at farms and in homes, is all too common. This has been known to cause serious pollution in waterways, breeding millions of bacteria and killing thousands of fish. But luckily, we don't need a complex solution to fix this problem. Rather, something as simple as a change of habit can help us fight back against food waste. In the early stages of our project, we worked through various concepts that addressed at-home consumption of milk to see how we might encourage consumers to not so quickly dispose of their product and perhaps give it some new life. To build the fundamentals of the spoil me concept, we consulted Dr. Brenda Abu, an assistant professor in the Wegman School of Health and Nutrition at RIT, providing us with a thorough understanding of the nutritional and chemical properties of milk as it sours. From our talks with her, we learned about lactobacillus, a friendly bacteria that is present in the lactic acid of fermented milk. It aids in the digestive system with a probiotic effect easing stomach pain and discomfort. While it may not smell or taste the best, fermented milk is nothing to be afraid of. In fact, there are many benefits in using it at home, from sustainability to promoting healthy eating. This gave way to the intention of Spoil Me by finding ways to use this beneficial ingredient for all manner of applications. We could develop a new, adoptable lifestyle. We envisioned a collaborative effort alongside milk producers to incorporate our concept into any type of milk packaging. This comes in a two-part solution, a pH indicator that can be applied to the inside of any milk container cap triggered by the fermentation of milk. Lactobacillus breaks down lactose, splitting it into glucose and galactose, which is then converted into lactic acid. This causes the pH level of milk to lower, triggering our colorimetric indicator. Ideally, this gradient of colors will surpass arbitrary and wasteful sell-by dates as the new standard. This is coupled with a universally designed label applied to any pre-existing milk container that guides consumers to an online compendium of alternative milk recipes. Here, consumers are provided with a vast amount of resources to utilize soured milk. From simple cheese to baked goods, we can replace sour cream, buttermilk, and a number of other ingredients with something we used to throw in the garbage. But it doesn't stop there. The lactic acid can provide outstanding benefits to skin. And milk paint, plastic, and glue have been used for years. Spoil Me is here to educate and inform on one of the most untapped materials of our generation. In building the brand, we realize that food waste is, above all else, a people problem. Therefore, our solution has to address abstract concepts like cultural norms, stigma, and misinformation. As designers, we transformed our basic concept into a brand set in motion, using emotional connection to further our mission. We paid special attention to small details in our presentation, so as to connect with the consumers and encourage them to shed their wasteful habits. Looking forward, with the right scientific, industry, and most importantly, community support, we are set to develop our system and recipes, which of course we tried many ourselves, including cottage cheese and ricotta, biscuits, cake and bread, 
face cleanser, and case in plastic, we can report an outstanding result. If we convince just 1% of Americans to bring spoil me into their homes, we could recover over 150 million pounds of milk that would have been wasted every year. Now that we've started it, it's time to join the movement. And that's movement with two O's. Welcome back, everyone. Uh, judges are ready to ask their questions. Carrie, why don't you start us off? Hi, that was a really interesting, simple product. I, I really like this idea. Um, you didn't mention in your um, presentation anywhere that you had consulted with anyone. Um, so you all go to school in one of the biggest dairy states in the nation. Um, and I think it would be absolutely essential to have um, consultations and buy-in buy from everyone from dairy farmers to dairy distributors to say people at Cornell, quality milk production services to your local, um, to the state's food inspection agency. Um, I know that most state agencies do have food waste uh, on their radar for sure. Um, so my question is, did you consult with any of these folks in your area so far? And what do you see in the future? Who, who do you plan to go to, you know, along the line in order to be on the consumers to actually sort of move this forward to the next stages. Uh, yeah, I um, just want to uh, say uh, that you might have missed it in the video and uh, it's totally fine. Obviously, we did um, mention uh, Dr. Brenda Abu, uh, who's a big part of our project. Uh, she was in, she's in the uh, Wegman School of Health and Nutrition at RIT. Um, she was a very big influence in this and um, that she was a primary source. Um, in regards to other sources that we used, uh, it, it, we did uh, do some community outreach, spoke with some dairy farmers as well. Um, wasn't, you know, it, it expanded on as much in the video, but I'm, I'm glad that this is something that you feel would uh, benefit even more. Um, I think even just going to the um, uh, biodesign uh, uh, gallery show, we uh, even contact, uh, spoke with a few people who are throwing in their own suggestions of what to do. Uh, with spoiled milk and um, so I think doing that more outreach um, is in our community is something that we would definitely set as a, a next um, a step in, in creating these recipes as well as understanding the industry. Great, thank you. Vicki, please go ahead. Great presentation, thank you and I agree with Carrie. I love the simplicity of it. Um, I had a question about how you would address the health risks of ingesting um, milk, maybe that it's gone a little too far. Um, how would you address that? Well, there's actually a little bit of like a difference between spoiled and soured milk. So spoiled milk, you definitely would want to avoid ingesting. You could still use it for the craft side of things. Mm -hmm. um, it's a temperature based thing. I think it's if you go above about 40 degrees Fahrenheit, that's kind of when it's like the turning point of turning uh, spoiled versus sour. Um, but actually talking to Brenda Abu, we found out that um, sour milk actually is more digestible. And so people who are lactose intolerant actually would probably have an easier time um, processing that kind of dairy. That's so interesting. Never knew that. Thank you. And if I may add on a little bit, I think a big thing is the sensor, the indicator we would hope would be a really great, great opportunity to make sure we can monitor that. And um, just wanted to add that as well. Great. Thank you very much. Wow. Lots of questions from the judges. Uh, I'm going to start with Michaela, and then Jean, you're up next. Yeah, thank you. Uh, building on the last question, actually, I was curious about how to distinguish a spoiled from uh, a sour product. So is the like indicator you are uh, developing uh, has any potential in also um, trying to detect a problem uh, and not only a level of sour uh, oh, oh, and this is my first question. Second question is about 
How much do you feel is important to educate consumers about what to do with the sour product? And uh, do you envision any role in crowdsourcing recipes of way of, I mean, using these ingredients from, I mean, traditional or different cultures and helping people to, to learn about that? I definitely, um, on, in regards to the indicator, I think it's something um, we have a lot of design experience. So a lot of this was focused on emotional connection and understanding uh, that human side of things. In regards to the indicator, we were able to um, do our research into, there's a few things on the market already that um, look at uh, food spoilage in general, milk spoilage in particular. Um, and I think drawing from that as well uh, would be really beneficial. The pH indicator would be able to uh, show when it has gone too far. Um, the fermentation itself, as Julia was saying, is really good um, actually in benefiting lactose intolerance. But I think the, um, the color metric indicator would also be there to indicate if it has gone too far past its, uh, its expiry, uh, non-expiry date, uh, if you could say. And then um, I'm, I'm happy to sort of pass it along also to my other uh, team members as well about the other side of the other answer, answer to your question. Yeah, we feel that um, not only the baking side, but also the other arts and crafts, whether you're making biscuits or like doing the face mask, it kind of gives an opportunity for connection between friends and family. Like we feel like you could be in the kitchen and it's like an educational resource, whether like the mom knows and is telling their child or like a friend is telling a friend like hey did you know you can actually use this milk rather than dumping it down the drain it kind of like gives use for um a product that we feel like people don't really know there is such a wide use for because you could use it for a substitution in baking such as like we said like uh buttermilk um you just have to change the recipe a little but it's perfectly fine and safe to use thank you great um elizabeth Hi, thank you for your presentation. Um, I think that the, um, the project is really interesting from, from a technical side, but I, I have a question for y'all a bit about uh, the cultural implications of your work. Um, I feel like milk is kind of, um, is kind of a battleground between you know, uh, traditional practices around food sovereignty and big ag, right? And so, you know, you're not allowed to transport unpasteurized milk across state lines, it's illegal. Um, and so I was wondering if you could speak a little bit to what you felt the cultural implications are um, of, your project, of your project of maybe, I don't know, reclaiming uh, certain traditional practices in the use of this particular product. And if you had any insights about that um, from your conversations with farmers, how did, how did they feel about it? Yeah, I actually um, uh, you know, spent an afternoon calling up farmers. And I think um, one thing def we definitely got a lot of uh, on that side of it was looking for uses for milk. Uh, a lot of dairy farmers, you know, they want milk to be out there, they want it to be used. And um, especially a lot were even heartbroken about the past year and having to dump it. And um, that what that can not only cause on just uh, an environmental uh, scale of things, but also just affecting the farmers, affecting individuals. Um, I definitely do think that this project is, um, you know, targeted, targeting certain things that um, especially Americans are very, um, you know, uh, sensitive to, which is, you know, food waste. We do a lot of, uh, you know, have a lot of food waste in this country, particularly because of our consumerism and other countries, not so much. And I think um, also maybe taking that example, um, using uh, cultural norms in other countries and trying to uh, bring a, uh, across a little bit more of that um, old fashioned family community connection. Um, but then that would come uh, with, also battling the, uh, the the sort of business, the, the big milk, you could say, side of it and trying to um, view that. And I think one of the best ways of doing that in this example is to, you know, start small, work on the recipe side of it, try and uh, find the best ways to connect with users over these applications, and then start to expand on that to see how can we get this into more people's hands, into maybe schools, maybe get it into homes more regularly. And um, even if that's just um, a small uh, inspiration to each individual, that maybe they will start to view their sour milk a little bit more differently. Great, thank you. Uh, Justice, last question. Thank you, um, Dan. 
This project is so interesting. I think I'm just reiterating uh, uh, the sentiment others have sort of expressed already. And so one of the things I like about the project is that <clears throat> you're sort of asking uh, folks, consumers, uh, to reimagine their relationship with milk. Uh, and as a result, disrupting the sort of practices with which they're engaging uh, in this relationship. Uh, I understand there's a pH indicator, but thinking about this practice or this sort of relationship, what are your thoughts about whether or not people will, will start wasting soured milk? That is a really ask, um, what would prevent people from doing the same thing with this new product? Well, I think, um... Uh, to, you know, jump in with that. I, I do agree that, you know, it's not all going to be solved all at once. Um, I think that's obviously a big thing, but uh, I, I, I believe that the best way of um, doing this is, you know, simply, like I said, with the last one is starting small. And um, I think what you'll even get is more of a result on a larger scale rather than just simply approaching milk itself, but all food um, that you might have in your home. I think the reason we approach milk was it is such a staple and it can be seen as very delicate, but also does have these benefits as well once it's gone past that date. Uh, I, I also would say that um, in order to prevent that wastage of the, the soured milk in itself, um, what would hopefully um, overcome that is finding the right applications and finding how to appeal to the user with those applications in the best way possible. Um, and I think we started simply with more of a mock-up um, website and recipes to show that. But what that really takes, and you know, as designers, we're very used to this, is going out to the user and, and seeing how they would best use this material and how they would best use this ingredient in their homes. And really then formulating the right recipes and the website to actually apply to the user rather than just simply handing them these recipes, but understanding you know, maybe we don't want this recipe because this will cause more waste than it will prevent, you know, and um, trying to find that balance there. And really that comes down to the user, I think. Right, we're out of time. Thank you, uh, RIT students. Thank you, judges. We're gonna move on now to Virginia Tech. Uh, please go ahead and roll the video. The beauty industry currently produces over 120 billion units of packaging each year. The products created within this industry contribute to the half million tons of plastic that are produced annually, 91% of which do not get recycled. This alarmingly high percentage led us to develop a new material to combat problems associated with the end life of plastic packaging within the beauty industry. Searching for a compostable alternative to plastic packaging, we found potential in cocoa pods as a material source, which also contain a waste stream ripe for innovation. Cocoa pods are the brightly colored vessels that contain the cocoa fruit and beans. Solely the cocoa beans are used within chocolate production, but what happens to the remainder of the pod? It's been proven that during the processing of cocoa beans, only 10% of the total cocoa fruit weight is used commercially, while the remaining 90% is discarded as waste and left on plantation sites to decompose. According to the International Cocoa Organization, the world generation of cocoa waste can be estimated to 700,000 tons per year. This continuous deposition of waste has resulted in detrimental environmental issues, including, but not limited to, silting, blockage of water drainage systems, flooding of rivers, water pollution, pests, and diseases. We want to focus on reducing and preventing the waste issues associated with plastic packaging and cocoa production, which begs the question, how do we combat these two dead ends by creating products and packaging whose materials are derived from one source? Through research, it was discovered that cocoa trees thrive when other plants provide shade and protection from changes in weather. When grown in conjunction with cocoa trees, plants like banana, apica, and palm benefit from a growing method known as companion planting. Companion planting provides a symbiotic relationship between plants by improving soil fertility, promoting biodiversity, and aiding in weed suppression. These healthier plants benefit farmers by producing a more abundant overall crop yield. Due to the compatibility and benefits of growing cocoa, banana, abaca, and palm plants together, we want to create a farm where plant fibers can be sourced. This is our ecosystem where we will derive all of our materials for our packaging and products. After discovering this potential growing environment, we developed a product and packaging designed with user preferences and global impact in mind.
This is Coco Berry, sustainability at your fingertips. Coco Berry is a face wash system that tackles the plastic production in the beauty industry, specifically within the face soap market. Our sustainable soap kits contain plant fiber packaging, cocoa sourced soap berries, and a banana textile shipping bag. For the plant fiber packaging, we partnered with a local nature paper maker from Sarvis Berry Studios named Gibby Watskin. It was there that we first experienced the paper making process, which involved learning about different plant fibers, how to cook down natural materials, how to make natural dyes, and how to pull paper sheets. To ensure that our packaging would only be sourced from the ecosystem we created, we used the plant fibers from cocoa pods, bananas, abaca, and palm to make the paper. The bananas and palm were chosen because they add strength and rigidity to the paper, while the abaca and cocoa were used as the main base for color. In order to get the fibers from the plant, our group cut down the plant's outer shell, stalk, or leaves to about one inch by one inch. Once cut down, the plants were put into large pots along with the water and a couple scoops of soda ash to be cooked down for a few days. The fibers were then rinsed thoroughly to remove any remaining soda ash. Once cooked and rinsed, the fibers were broken down into smaller pieces, first by hand and then by being blended. When the fibers were the correct size, they were combined together using a Hollander beater. They were then placed in a large container and stored by adding water to prevent the pulp from drying out. The paper pouring process required significant experimentation to understand the correct pulp solution, paper thickness, and drying time. To test out different solutions and thicknesses, we poured a few sample sheets. The final pulp mixture required 6 cups of pulp, about 18 cups of water, and around 1.5 cups of a slime solution. Once the desired mixture was created, it was hand poured into sheets to have a thickness of about 1.5 millimeters when dried. To set up for paper pouring, we placed dampened Pellon sheets on top of the decal screens. We then took 1 liter jugs full of pulp, slowly poured the solution over our hands, and moved the pulp throughout the screen area to evenly distribute the mixture. On average, we poured 9 layers of the pulp solution. After being poured, the sheet was transferred onto a wooden board covered by a blanket. A Pellon sheet, four to five more blankets and towels, and another wooden board were then placed on top of the sheet, which was then taken to a pressing machine to speed up the drying process. To create the bowl, the packaging form went through a lot of different iterations involving the bowl height, wall angle, wall thickness, and lid design. The goal for the packaging was to create a reusable container that the consumer would want to display on their sink. Additionally, we wanted the bowl to hold approximately three months worth of soap when used twice a day, keep them safe and dry, and provide the user with effortless access to the soaps inside. The fibers were combined to make the paper durable, but if ever damaged, the cocoa berry bowl can be easily composted since there are no harsh chemicals in the paper. In order to form the bowl, we 3D modeled and printed each iteration using the prints as a mold to test each design. Molding the sheets to these curved forms proved to be a challenge early on, and after much trial and error, we came up with a process to make the molding more efficient and better quality. This process included darting the sheet using pulp to smooth down any bumps or folds, and a lot of pressing and shaping with our fingers. In addition to the packaging, the cocoa berry soaps themselves were created using materials within our desired ecosystem. While bar and liquid face soaps already exist, our goal was to create a new and convenient experience for the user. Since we wanted the product to also be made from our desired ecosystem, our cocoa berries are made from African black soap. African black soap is dark in color and can sometimes resemble dark chocolate, which was brought up as a concern during our process. While we hope no one would ingest the soap, it is only made from three ingredients, cocoa pod, palm oil, and plantain skins, ensuring that it's non-toxic and conducive for good health. The ridges on the soaps were designed to emulate the grooves found on cocoa pods while providing the user with an easier finger grip. Our crushable, dissolvable soap concept was inspired by hot cocoa bomb products, which allowed for our product to be single use. The soap berries contained within the bowl provide a simple process for washing your face. For the user's convenience, each berry is portioned allowing for single use, which in turn prevents the waste of the actual wash. To use the soap, a single berry is taken out of the bowl, placed onto the palm of the hand, and crushed with the other hand. Once the soap is crushed, the user can run their hands underwater while rubbing them together to create a lather. After a lather forms, the user can gently apply the soap to their face, rinse with water, and then dry off. To make cocoa berry, we envision that both the packaging and the soaps will be handmade in Ghana and the Ivory Coast where cocoa pods are abundant. The reason behind wanting this to be a handmade product rather than being manufactured on a large scale is that these main cocoa production areas are second and third world countries that don't have much experience with industrialization. 
We want to focus on these areas specifically because in addition to environmental issues, the cocoa production industry contains many social issues. Although Ghana is the second largest exporter of cocoa beans, the Ivory Coast being the largest, their farmers receive a mere fraction of their crop's profit due to the set farm gate prices and high taxes. Additionally, besides cultivating the crop itself, there aren't many other industries within Ghana that provide the farmers with ways to use the cocoa they produce, thus leading to the aforementioned discarded material. Cocoa Berry aims to work with small farms to cultivate sustainable crop practices and produce the raw materials that we need for our products. We work with these farmers and offer them new sources of income to produce the handmade paper bowls right from the natural source. With these methods, we hope to provide the opportunity of a new industry to these cocoa farmers and include them on the high-value production side of the cocoa business instead of just being a producer. Moving forward, we want to explore how this new proposed ecosystem could benefit a more diverse range of products. The cocoa berry soaps and packaging are only two very specific use cases for the cocoa waste material, and through further innovation, the future could see a revolution in the way packaging is produced. Our production process can be easily altered to accommodate a wide range of packaging needs from small to large, thin to thick, and across any and all industries, not only the soap market. We have looked into how to produce the natural paper on an industrial scale, which involves using a press mold, making the possibilities endless. The adaptability behind our naturally sourced paper is the real power behind our proposal for the future of packaging. And we're back with the Virginia Tech students. Uh, thank you for a great presentation. Judges, let's go right into it. Uh, Vicki, you are first one. You're on mute. Thanks. Um, great presentation, very comprehensive. The kit was beautifully designed and well thought out with the packaging and the cocoa berries. My question's more about the berries. I love the way that they crack, you know, when, when you apply them. Um, did you, were you able to do any cost analysis um, in, in terms of what a cost of, what the cost would be of one of the berries? Students, go ahead and turn on your uh, audio if you haven't already. Uh, hi, thank you for your question. Um, so as of right now for the soaps, we were, aiming to kind of have a more or in terms of price price range we were thinking more of a little bit more expensive than um an average bar soap but then not as expensive as a more higher end soap product but in terms of our materials we still wanted to investigate that moving forward with the soaps um the soaps were just one product that we used that incorporated part of our ecosystem so in the future we would like to investigate the price system a bit more for those Great, thank Great. you. Thank you. Kathy? Thanks. Hi, you all, um, and congratulations on a great presentation. My question is, how you how did you arrive at the, um, the, the work that you're doing with the cocoa berry and that, that reuse for that waste? And were you, what was the research you did around that? And who, you know, did you have conversations with any farm, local farmers around that as well? Yeah, so when we first started this project, we were looking at um, waste materials. We had just come off a project where we focused a lot on waste materials um, and also companion planting. So putting those two things together, uh, we noticed that the chocolate plant along with banana and abaca can all work really well together. And that kind of inspired the, the look towards what we could do with that. Um, and then looking at the UN's uh, you know, sustainability goals for the future, one of the ones that we uh, focused on was waste and packaging in specific. Um, so that's where the, the paper came from. And then working with our uh, our contact back in Florida, Virginia, who does paper art, she kind of led us down the path of helping us design and, uh, and model and create these final products. And can I just can I just follow up and ask about the the Ghana the connection to West Africa, and were you in touch with any um, local farmers specifically? Yeah. So um, we, when we had looked into cocoa and all these other plants, we noticed that you know there's a big um, opportunity to go out over there and set up 
some type of uh, working relationship. Um, but as this project is still pretty early days, um, we haven't gotten to that part yet, but the research shows that this might be a possibility. Um, so that would be one of our next steps going forward. Thank you. Great, Elizabeth, you're up next. I think most of my, uh, or a lot of my question was actually covered by Kathy's. Um, I think there's a long history of uh, Western, Western designers uh, designing things and systems and ecosystems for uh, Africa and the rest of the world in general. And so I think that, um, I think that there was a certain lack of sensitivity in your presentation with respect to the fact that you're here in the United States trying to design an ecosystem in a country that is um, that is not yours and that and that there's a, a very long and fraught colonial history that um, that is following that you're following up on. Um, so I I think that that was something that was missing from your presentation and maybe you can speak to that. Yeah, thank you. I think we still need to look into that in the future. You're definitely right. I've noticed that while we're going through this process. So I, I think figuring out um, someone to talk to or uh, looking into a better way to present this might be better. But th yeah, thank you for that. Great. Carrie, you're up. Hi. Yeah. Um I agree with what a lot of the other questioners have said and asked. Um, your product is really beautiful. Um, my question is really about the water use. Um, so, you know, your paper making is notorious for using a lot of water and having a lot of water waste. And it seems that your product is no different, um, especially um, speaking to Elizabeth's question as well. How do you envision the water use working with say these small manufacturers and farmers in these rural areas um, especially when it's often really difficult for people in those areas to just get their own drinking water and cooking water um, it seems like this might be a completely rate limiting step in that case um, and you know what do you do with the wastewater in those systems um, can you speak to that Uh, yes, so um, we did consider water as we were um, looking into our project and we did a bit of research on water usage in general with, with the paper making industry and so far what we have found is that um, I guess the, the good news, bad news of it is that our product from what we saw wouldn't contain any more water than usual as the normal water usage in paper making deals with a lot of the toxins that they have to remove, which is something we wouldn't have to deal with. But of course, it's still going to be an issue with paper making in general. So I think that moving forward, we would like to investigate that more, especially as you mentioned with um, a country that may be struggling with water issues, having to keep that in mind. We definitely would want to move forward with that, but we did consider, um, or we did compare that in the industry versus how our product would fit into the industry. And moving forward, we would like to look into that more for sure. Great, thank you, Haley. Amanda, please, you're up. Yes, okay, so thank you so much for the presentation. I want to talk about the, you know, the market perspective. So he mentioned you know, having to get cocoa from West Africa. And um, for two years, for example, there's been cocoa shortages and um, crisis in Ghana and Ivory Coast. So, the way you know we they get to uh, send cocoa to Western world has tremendously tremendously reduced because now they are trying to be careful because they know that quite a lot of countries are really interested in cocoa. So how do you tackle cocoa shortages? One and two, how do you have um, how do you intend to um, build access or connections to the government because now there are strict uh limitations you know put across on um, organizations or countries who wish to you know get cocoa out of africa into their country yeah i think the cocoa is a big limiting factor i mean when we, when we uh, look into companion planting uh, and packaging as a whole in this economy um, i think using different plants as well um, to supplement if a cocoa shortage was to happen or, or did happen might be something to look into. Um, but also when we uh, did some research, we had seen that 
the the government and middlemen in this take most of the profit from the cocoa industry. So and I think talking to them and figuring that out might be another way to kind of help out the people that we're looking towards um, without trying to, to push anything over on them. But yeah, we're still in early days with this and, and still trying to figure out any specifics on this right now. Thank you. Great, thank you. Thank you, Amanda. Thank you, Virginia Tech team. Uh, we're gonna now move to the next team. That's Central St. Martins. Thank you, team. Hello from the Maldives. My name is Nadwa and I am part of the eco-organization based in the Maldives. As an island state in the middle of the Indian Ocean, we are currently facing a lot of issues related to climate change. But one of the main concerns for us is the increasing dependency on imported foods and a growing fast food trend. People here in the Maldives eat more and more packaged and processed food. One reason why we see this is of course due to the global food trends that is slowly taking hold. But we also have low soil fertility and a lack of space for farming and agriculture to produce milk and other protein and mineral rich foods to feed all of our population. We as a nation face a lot of health concerns and economical loss due to the overconsumption of these processed food items. 25% of people in the age group between 5 and 15 are underweight and suffer from malnutrition. On the other side of the spectrum, 82% of Maldivians over the age of 35 are either overweight, diabetic, or obese. Moreover, the lack of trace elements in women's diets during pregnancy has a domino effect on the fetus and progressively the child. The microbiome represents the genetic material of all the microbes living inside the body. Recent studies have demonstrated that packaged, transformed, and fast food have a negative effect on the microbiome. The gut microbiome is key to our health since it is a part of our immune system. Diets based on locally grown foods create a close contact between people and soil and may contribute to preventing diseases such as cancer, unbalanced cholesterol levels, and weight disorders. We acquire microbes from the soil in which the fruit and vegetables we consume are grown. With more than 90% of their food being imported, the Maldives are in a position of high dependency on other countries. The Maldives import an average of 35,000 tons of food every year. This is equivalent to an expenditure of 1.35 billion US dollars. What if we could tackle the issue of reliance on imported produce by producing essential foods locally? What if we could redesign food habits and provide new kinds of nutrient-rich food? What if we could cure the most prevalent health conditions in the Maldives by rethinking the way we eat? With Etols, we create a new and local food system specifically fit to the needs of the Maldivian population. The first aspect is alkalizing the soil, making it possible to grow a diverse range of fruit and vegetables. Simultaneously, the system allows the production of single-cell organisms with high protein content containing essential amino acids which are otherwise available only in animal and dairy products. This is produced through the help of microorganisms such as spirulina, yeast, and filamentous fungi. We designed a bioreactor that enables us to produce all these components simultaneously in one machine. The main chamber of the bioreactor applies a bioregulation technique developed and tested by our team in the UK. To lower the pH of the soil, acetic acid is added to the soil and mixed, extracting the carbonate responsible for high alkalinity of the soil. The effervescent reaction indicates excess CO2 removed from the soil. The calcium acetate filtrate can then be transformed to calcium carbonate using a sodium carbonate solution for further use as construction material, for example. 
The acidified soil is then mixed with domestic waste to increase soil microbial life and fertility. These experiments were conducted locally in the Maldives. We tested the alkalinization on the Maldivian soil itself. The experiments were a success, and the locals were able to lower the pH levels of their soil to make it cultivable. The second chamber of the bioreactor is used to grow the biomass of Rhizopus oligosporus. This filamentous fungi is fermented in a liquid culture made of a mixture of sugars generated by local food waste and water. At this stage, the organisms are able to proliferate and generate high amounts of proteins, minerals, and vitamins. The structure of the Saccharomyces cerevisiae closed compartment mimics the one assigned to Rhizopus oligosporus. After around two weeks, the biomass generated is ready to be extracted from the liquid culture. Simultaneously, algae spirulina is cultivated. The process is activated by providing a constant amount of CO2 from the environment and CO2 generated as a byproduct of the rhizopus cultivation combined with sunlight, which allows this organism to complete photosynthesis. After 10 days, it is possible to collect and process the biomass. Now, Rhizopus oligosporus, spirulina, and Saccharomyces cerevisiae are ready to be processed. The biomasses of organisms have to be dried. The drying doesn't change the nutrient content, but is useful for extending the shelf life of the product and preventing contamination. As the Maldives have sun all year round, the biomass can even be dried in open air. Experiments with food demonstrate the possibility to re-establish the correct balance of nutritional values of several dishes just by altering the recipes in favor of the usage of single-cell proteins as supplements. I do enjoy it because it was definitely unique. No, because I've never had anything like that before. I would actually because it's a bit more lighter. In conclusion, Etolls makes nutrient-rich food accessible to the local people of the Maldives. We provide a system where essential foods can be grown locally and thereby minimize the dependency on imports. Etolls makes local foods fashionable again by adding new components to the kitchen table. In this way, we want to stop the growing fast food trend and prevent a larger impact on local health. And we're back with the team from Central St. Martins. Thanks for that great presentation. Uh, we'll open up with Kathy as our first judge with a question. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And congratulations on a really wonderful presentation and idea. Um, I'm really enthusiastic about it. And I was curious how you came up with the connection between UK and, and the Maldives. Um, where did that come from? Uh, we collaborated with, thank, thanks for 
your question. <laughs> we collaborated with this uh, NGO in Maldives and it was really, really interesting because for us, they was like, mm, they played a key role because obviously the Maldives are, mm, we cannot communicate with them really easily at first for the distance and also for the pandemic because they are actually now in lockdown. So it was kind of difficult for us. But this collaboration was really, really great. And Satom, Milal, there are a lot of people that helped uh, us a lot. Uh, and yeah, uh, and we collaborated with them, uh, especially yeah, for the experiment part, but also for the f design of the dishes. Because yeah, we experimented from the beginning uh, also to understand the local Food culture. Uh, we asked them to make a diary for 10 days in which six participants uh, documented their diets for one week and they sent us pictures and was really great for us yeah, to understand the culture and also to re-elaborate these dishes and to create something new. Great, thank you. Thank you, Kathy. Jean, please go ahead. You're on mute. Um, I have a simple question. Uh, we're in your research. Were you able to find any health studies on the impact of eating spirulina, yeast, and fungi as a more substantial part of one's diet? So I'll take this one, yeah. Uh, so for example, um, a lot, we, we did get a fair amount of data where which basically showed that a lot of Maldivians are anemic, which is they have low iron content and spirulina is something which has got high, high which is higher in iron content. That's uh, there are multiple papers published on that. So that's kind of where we went with the spirulina bit. Um, as for the proteins, uh, I mean, um, rhizopus and uh, nutritional yeast, both of these are high in protein and they kind of act as so because because uh, it's an island country because the um, you don't have much land to rear livestock. Uh, yes, of course they do. You consume a lot of fish, uh, but uh, um, rhizopus and uh, uh, nutritional yeast these are basically high in proteins as well. So they kind of can act as a much more um, small scale supplement for this and kind of can replace the protein content that you would otherwise get from um, dairy products or uh, poultry or other uh, sources. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Jean. Lisa, please go ahead. Thank you. That was a really interesting presentation. Can you tell me how big is the bioreactor? Is this a home-based bioreactor or is it something the size of a swimming pool? So the way we envisioned this design was to basically create something which is which could be modular and scalable. So at the current, the current size you're looking at, uh, the entire structure would be around three meters by two meters. That's the kind of size we're looking at right now. Uh, which would be enough to feed maybe uh, which would be enough to grow uh, produce for to be able to sustain three to five families uh, but the envisionment was to have something which you can kind of, which can be scaled up and down depending on the use case and depending on where you want to install it um, and that was that was that's that's that was what was kept in mind and we actually came up with the with this very blocky kind of form structure for the bioreactor itself um, so that um, and the, the the manufacturing process is also extremely simple, um, and th th that's how we kind of envision it to be a very scalable or and a modular system where you can install depending on your context, depending on the context of use. Yeah, and I think in the Maldives is like I mean we have to imagine it's many different uh, or islands of different scales. So like imagining we could create this um, this bioreactor depending also maybe on the size of the communities. So I think in general, it was more meant to be really a community kind of space uh, to create, to get people together and kind of, yeah, have this food system. And I think, yeah, this is the great way that, you know, depending on the size of the communities and the island size, we can kind of scale this. Uh, yeah. yeah. This is very interesting because the, the, I'll just one thing that's really interesting is that there isn't very much discussion anymore of how to feed the entire world and what you're showing is seems to offer some possible way to do that without going to uh, farms yeah i mean of course uh, for now it's kind of 
probably we couldn't feed a whole, like for example, uh, kind of our case study for the moment is uh, the island Kudahuvadu. So they have 2000 people uh, living there, around 2000. So of course, at the scale that we are imagining the bi rector at the moment, we couldn't feed everyone, but it was meant really also to kind of release, let's say the pressure on the import so that they have less dependency on kind of, yeah, this food that like enters by ship basically every day and kind of offer a local alternative at least in some extent. We have Thank time for one more question. Um, go ahead, Carrie. Um, quick question, just asking more about the nutritional aspects. Um, your graph showed that you were able to increase vitamins and minerals um, with these diets. Can you break that down for us? What were these vitamins and minerals? That's to say, like, are they ones that it matters, <laughs> you know, that, that it, that we actually increase or are they, you know, things that are already pretty abundant and that people are going to excrete anyway? Um, well, so like, as Anshuman said before, uh, anemia is one of this, uh, one, I think globally seen, uh, uh, one of this main health issues that people face. No, and, and iron is just one example, um, which, for example, the spirulina really can offer. Um, and yeah, so iron is the spirulina part. The, the two others really focus more, I would say, on this protein content to kind of help, um, yeah, like, uh, or be a supplement for dairy products, really. So I would say, really, the spirulina is the vitamin and iron and mineral, um, yeah, trace element bomb let's say <laughs> i don't know if that answered the question and just just uh, just to add on to that so uh, demographically a lot of people in that area are also deficient in vitamin d and vitamin b12 yeah. uh, because the typically the foods that they eat or consume over there are not the foods that are high in vitamin b12 and vitamin d and spirulina kind of acts as a supplemental uh, route for the for those as well yeah Great. Thank you, Carrie, for your question. Thank you, CSM, for your project. We're going to take a 15-minute break now. Um, we have arranged some commercials, artist videos, former student projects for you to watch uh, while we get, uh, we get ready for the next session. Thank you all for being with us this morning. It's運命の赤い糸で結ばれている。そんな神話のような糸を紡ぐ解雇が2016年この世に誕生した。アートと科学の創造で新しい神話が生まれる時代始まったのかもしれない。
うなんて恋はそんな簡単な話じゃないだなんてそりゃ分かってるんですけどでもそんなことやってみないと分かんないじゃないですか失敗は成功のもとだって施術教授も言ってたじゃないですかだから私作っちゃったんですねえ新しいシーンは一緒に作ろうよ作ろうよ作ろうよそうしそう Live from New York, where the world's first Cast 9 0 opened earlier today despite ongoing protests. The public backlash first started in 2051 when the Universal Genetic Screening Law was passed, requiring preventable genetic disorders to be removed from embryos in order for them to qualify for universal free health care. Since then, scientists and doctors have been inching closer to creating fully designed humans, what the public refers to as designer babies. The law states that parents are not allowed to handpick desired genes for their offspring, but Cas9 puts chance back into the equation. We spoke earlier to Cas9's first family unit to hear a little bit more about how it works. All of our genes are in our 23 pairs of chromosomes. At the Cas9, our chromosomes will be copied and stored in the gene bank so they can later be recombined and synthesized to form the genome of a new baby. We play around with Bebe Roulet for each chromosome. The wheel ensures a randomized selection, but players can increase their odds by betting extra chips. And what if you don't like a certain gene on a chromosome assigned to your baby? CRISPR tokens, just CRISPR them right out. This is Brianna, one of our parents playing at the Cast Network tonight. I'm Brianna, daughter of the president and CEO of the Gene Bank in the Cast n i n e I'm paying for us to have this baby, and I feel so blessed that the government has given us access to this sort of technology. It's a really great option for people like me. Yes, it's expensive, not everyone can afford it, but what I can't afford is to have a baby that's just average. I feel lucky to be chosen to be part of this group. I grew up before humans were screened for genetic diseases, and I've had really crippling medical bills because of it, so I know I can't afford my own baby. But Brianna hired me as the primary caretaker and genetic parent of our baby because I have blue eyes, so I guess I got lucky after all. This is truly an amazing step in the scientific community. Genetic regulations have hindered mankind to push the limits of the human race, but Cas9 is a step in the right direction. Why should we keep settling for natural selection when we can select whatever we want? Now let's check in to see how the game is going. Alrighty, chromosome 9. Chromosome 9 may determine your child's eyebrow thickness, forehead freckles, lip width, blood type, and vulnerability to malignant melanoma. Place your bets. Okay, the girls are placing their bets. Hmm, looks like Brianna's got a lot of chips on the board. Aaron is next to nothing. Now they're spinning the wheel. And 
Molly Wynn. Oh no, not those eyebrows on my baby. Crispa goes out right now. What? Are you really going to risk editing my chromosome? What if it messes something up? It doesn't work every time, you know? You could replace her eyebrows with mine. Oh, please. How dare you? Whatever. I still want the chromosome. And I choose Aaron's chromosome number nine to complete the pair. Uh, next, we'll play for chromosome 17. Looks like the carrier type is shaping up. We'll check back in with them a little later. Now let's hit the streets to hear from some of the protesters outside the Cast 9 -o. Protesters are gathering to voice their outrage towards what some are calling the next eugenics movement. This Cast 9 -o needs to be shut down now before we raise an entire generation of elitist superhumans. Our government should promote equality, but this government-run Cast 9 -o is promoting rampant inequality. Some say they fear being further stripped of their reproductive rights. Others are comparing this to the 2020 reversal of Roe v. Wade. Cas Ninos are mining all of our genetic information and selling it to the highest bidder. They say they want to maintain diversity, make sure our kids are healthy, but they just want to control procreation. They want to decide who gets to be a human and who doesn't. Cas Ninos are eugenics. They don't want impurities. Practice safe science with Amino. Genetic engineering and life sciences are safe activities when you follow these simple guidelines. Do not eat or drink near your experiments. Keep your experiment at least 10 feet away from any food or drink. Under no circumstances should you eat any of the kit's content. While the ingredients in these kits are non-pathogenic, some persons, such as immunocompromised persons, can be affected by large numbers of bacteria and should talk to their doctor before doing any experiment. Wash your hands before and after manipulating your experiment or the hardware. Wear gloves even when cleaning your station or handling the kit contents. After you put on your gloves, be aware of what you touch. Try not to touch your face or scratch itches with your gloved fingers. If using the DNA Playground or BioExplorer, place it on a stable work surface. Keep it level at all times. Clean up your station before and after use. Use a 10% solution of chlorinated bleach generously sprayed onto a paper towel and rub onto any contaminated surface. Find a container to hold the inactivation bag where you will discard used consumables. An old one liter yogurt container, large plastic cup, or the like will do. Used consumables will be loops, any tube, or used petri dishes. Eyewear is not provided but can be worn. Follow these safety guidelines for your safety and the success of your experiments. Learn more at amino.bio. Hi, I'm Dan. I'm Vina. I'm Alex. And I'm Emma, and we're the team behind Biodesign Challenge. We want your help to publish our first ever book, Biodesign Challenge, a retrospective. BDC is an international education program and competition that's shaping the first generation of biodesigners. We pair high school and university students with artists, designers, and scientists to envision, create, and critique transformational applications in biotechnology. Our projects have gone on to show in museums and galleries around the world, and many have served as inspiration for new companies. The book will be a full-color celebration of work produced by the BDC community over the last five years. It will feature 28 projects that bridge art, design, and biotechnology. Not only will it include essays by our alumni, but perspectives from eminent practitioners in the field. Newcomers will find a primer on biodesign and how it's shaping the future of sustainability. For those already familiar, the book will offer insights from thought leaders, including biologist Paul Fremont, curator William Myers, and many others. 
It'll also include a foreword by Paula Antonelli, Senior Curator of Architecture and Design at MoMA. BDC has collaborated with organizations including Science Sandbox, the National Endowment for the Arts, the Parsons School of Design, and the Museum of Modern Art, where we hold our annual summit. We are publishing the book in partnership with the University Science Center in Philadelphia. So, if you're interested in learning more about innovative and fascinating topics, or if you just want to be awesome and support the next generation of bio designers, then this book is for you. Every pledge, no matter how big or small, helps bring us closer to our goal. Thank you for your support. We can't wait to share the retrospective with you. Welcome back everyone to session number two of 
uh, the BDC Summit day two. Uh, we're gonna get started with our next video. This is University of Michigan. Hi there, my name is Marvin the Mealworm. I was born in a styro mill farm located in a small town known as Ann Arbor, Michigan. The Great Lakes region is my home, as it is to many other organisms. Unfortunately, however, it's been polluted with more than 22 million pounds of plastic every year. To combat this problem, my friends and I are proud to help take part in decreasing the amount of polluted plastic that unfortunately is a major problem not only here, but also on a global scale. Before we get into how I can help, let's look at some general statistics around this pollution problem. Did you know that over 6,300 million metric tons of petroleum-based synthetic plastic waste, including polystyrene, is generated each year? 20 million tons of polystyrene is produced per year and makes up a major pollutant of soils, lands, and bodies of water. If you look around, you can probably recognize a lot of items containing polystyrene, for example, common uses of polystyrene include disposable eating utensils, styrofoam beverage cups, food containers, and egg cartons. Since there is currently no viable way to globally recycle this material, this plastic ends up taking up space in landfills and oftentimes finds its way to waterways. According to EPE, a leader in environmentally advanced packing, polystyrene foam, or styrofoam, makes up 90% of all marine debris. Those single-use food and beverage containers people throw away after a delicious takeout meal are the main culprits. So you might be asking yourself, why is the mealworm telling me this horrible data? Well, here's where you'll now see how I can be a part of the solution. Listen to this. I'm a pretty special guy. The Tenebrio Molitor Linnaeus larvae, aka me and my friends here, have the ability to biodegrade polystyrene. That's so cool, isn't it? Huh? Did you just ask... How is a tiny mealworm able to digest styrofoam? Well, here's how it works. Fun fact, I can survive off of polystyrene alone. Once I'm able to chew the plastic into much smaller pieces, it becomes a lot easier for me to expose the plastic to the enzymes in my body. These enzymes in my body work very hard to depolymerize and degrade the styrofoam pieces. So, in short, my chewing behaviors in combination with my gut bacteria are responsible for my special ability of breaking down polystyrene. This combination is so effective that I can ingest up to 65% of provided styrofoam with only a 12 to 15 hour gut retention time. In the end, the plastic is safely converted into carbon dioxide and lipids in my body. Yeah, I know what you're thinking. We mealworms are pretty impressive. So, with this discovery, I'm now helping an organization called Styromeal to clean up styrofoam pollution found in Michigan waterways. The goal is to combat plastic pollution, primarily polystyrene in the Great Lake region, while also appealing to local fishermen and family-run pet supply stores, as they are an essential part to this overarching cycle. Here's how it works. First, polystyrene waste will be gathered from the lakes and land by Styromeal employees or by community service volunteers. On a larger scale, polystyrene waste could be recycled to Styromeal facilities. Mealworms are grown and farmed at the Styromeal facilities, our egg incubation stage usually takes about four to seven days. Then we're in the larvae stage for approximately 10 weeks. However, if mealworms are kept in close proximity with one another, we can stay in the stage for much longer. Once the polystyrene reaches our facilities, it will be cleaned and shredded into about one centimeter increments. Now that the polystyrene is in much smaller bits, it will be given to us mealworms to eat and digest with the help of specific enzymes in our guts. Since we aren't just breaking down the plastic, rather, we're digesting it and converting some of it into CO2, science shows that mealworms who have feasted on polystyrene are just as healthy and safe to consume by others as mealworms who didn't eat the plastic. It's a win-win situation. Normally, the larvae would pupate and then become a beetle. However, before this stage of our lives, we will be packaged and sold to local fishermen and pet stores to be used as bait and animal feed. Myself and other worms can be sold and used either alive or dried. We can be sold at both local stores and online stores for a low price, which will encourage fishers to purchase our product. Fish that commonly eat mealworms as bait include bluegill, trout, perch, bass, catfish, and crappie. So that may have been a lot of information thrown at you, but long story short, I'm a hero and I'm saving the planet one meal at a time. 
Okay, I'm not solving the plastic pollution problem outright, but I can be a great help to the situation. Oh, someone's calling me. Huh? Something about having fish for dinner? Or the fish having me for dinner? I don't know. Anyways, gotta go. Use compostable packaging whenever you can and recycle plastic that can be recycled. I love eating, but I can only consume so much plastic. So reduce your waste as much as possible. Thanks for listening, guys. See ya. We are back with University of Michigan. Thanks for being here. Questions from the judges. No questions. Ah, here we go. Uh, Lisa, please go ahead. Hi. Uh, do, have you done any research on, um, on on what the actual impact of eating polystyrene is on the worms? And also, uh, have you considered feeding the worms to humans? Hi. Uh, my name is April, and I've actually looked into a few articles um, revolving around these specific larvae, um, and a lot of them have suggested that it doesn't necessarily affect their physiology or their health in any way. So they would compare groups of larvae eating just like normal the normal diet that they are typically fed um, versus just polystyrene alone, and then also a combination of the two. And it doesn't seem like it although they do prefer their normal diet, it doesn't seem to actually affect them in any negative way. Um, so that's how we were actually able to decide to move forward with this idea in the first place, because just ethics wise, it wouldn't seem wise for us to move forward with anything that would negatively affect the worms in the first place. Great, thank you, Lisa. Jean? Um, do you have a sense of scale, like uh, how big a piece and how many, you know, worms or how big of a box? And then did you do any research on what they prefer in terms of like polystyrene, clean polystyrene, dirty polystyrene, uh, since your part of your proposal is pulling them out of, you know, sort of lakes and rivers and grass and, you know, they'll be dirty. So I just had a thought about that. Just one. Um, I can answer this question again, just because I kind of looked a lot into like the articles themselves um, and the science information. Um, but that is a very good question. We did not actually look into the cleanliness of the actual like styrofoam, but we did look into like some articles that compared styrofoam from different um, actual products. So comparing like styrofoam from uh, cups or styrofoam from boxes, like packaged boxes. Um, and there were articles on that. And also it was a bit ambiguous to find um, information on how much could be consumed just because it, a lot of the articles did feed them different amounts. And also it's not necessarily easy to like kind of count by hand how many larvae you're given in the first place. Um, but one of the articles that we looked into had a time frame of 32 days and it wasn't necessarily specific with how many larvae um, in the first place, but we're just going to assume that it's a handful of larvae in this, um, in this like date within the data, but just from 32 days as a time frame, the total consumption was um, rounded up to one gram of polystyrene by like a large amount of these larvae within the data. Oh. Okay, so I have one more question. Um, did you buy any mealworms and do it, like get a box of mealworms and do it in the backyard kind of thing? Yes, yeah, so we did buy some live mealworms and we did do our own little experiment to see if the mealworms would actually eat the styrofoam. And so we had about 50 to 100 mealworms with one, like one centimeter piece of styrofoam in a container. And they did end up eating it in about 11 days. So we, that, that checked out. <laughs> Great, thank you, Jean. Uh, Laura, please go ahead. Yeah, I actually had the same question about um, your research process and um, to just kind of expand on that, if you could talk about the images you had of the prototypes for the styro meal facilities and, and also for the bait and talk a little bit more about your the research and experimentation that went into that. 
Um, so the prototypes that we have for our facility are more just like 3D renderings. And we um, researched how you would grow mealworms and they're grown in usually if you're kind of doing it at home and on a larger scale in different um, drawers and there's different stages of their lives. So when they first grow and become in the larva and then when they pupate and become beetles, but we would try to keep them at the lar larva stage. And we, there was research done that said, if you keep them um, close in close proximity, they can stay in the larva stage for longer. And originally it's more like 10 weeks. I think the research said that they'd be in the larva stage. Um, so that was kind of the time frame that we would keep them in the facility. And then um, what was the second latter part of your question? Oh, it was about the, the other um, prototype for the packaging, for the bait, and um, just kind of thinking about what kind of research went into that in terms of thinking about um, buy-in from people that would use the bait. So the way we, um, when we ordered our mealworms, they came, with, or they came to us in a card, cardboard box with some like paper in it. And so we were thinking something similar, like a cardboard box to transport them in. Um, and so we don't uh, transport them in more plastic to that continues mm -hmm. the plastic pollution problem. So that's how we came up with that. Um, yes. Thank you. Great, thank you, Laura. Justice, please go ahead. Yeah, I have a, this is an interesting project. Uh, uh, I wondered two things, uh, where you sort of came, maybe if you could tell us a story about how you ran into this discovery. Um, and then the second is um, a question about, and this came up in another um, idea you posed um, in Q and A. It's uh, about the mealworm factory footprint. And so um, how large a scale would you need to sort of have any meaningful impact on uh, plastic or styrofoam waste? And if you don't have that sort of measure, what sort of variables or factors would you begin to think about in pursuing such a calculation? Um, I can answer the first part, um, just how the idea even emerged, because um, my team was actually initially looking into a few things for my class um, at the University of Michigan. Um, and initially for this path, we proposed something that initially had to do with uh, like pheromones. So basically create, creating synthetic pheromones um, and using that to actually degrade plastic, not polystyrene. It was um, a different type of plastic, like plastic bags, just because that's an issue in my hometown. Um, that was something that like kind of came into my mind just because my hometown, I have to pay to use plastic bags just because um, it's just such an issue. There's a large usage of it um, and no really great way of to dispose of it. So that was our initial proposal. But then discussing with our professor, she proposed looking into something that wasn't necessarily um, synthetic based and artificial almost just turning to something that was more economically and environmentally friendly and that's kind of where we looked into different types of plastic and we came across polystyrene and how this type of larvae was actually able to degrade and different strains of this larvae as well this family um, was actually able to uh, degrade polystyrene and it didn't really seem to have any like downsides to this idea. So that's how we actually decided to move forward with this instead of the pheromones initial <laughs> proposal. Great. Yeah. And as, oh, sorry, do we have more time? No, no, please go ahead. Okay. As for the second question about the facility um, footprint, we haven't done um, as we haven't gone in depth on research about the exact numbers, but things to consider would be how many mealworms we need, probably in the millions. But when we um, when we ordered the mealworms, we got a thousand and they came in less than like a one foot by one foot box. 
So the mealworms don't necessarily take up a ton of space, but the plastic or the polystyrene that would be coming into the facility would. So that would be the main issue to try to think or um, design around would be how, how long the polystyrene takes to get rid of by the mealworms versus like how fast it's coming into our facility. So we would have to do some more research around that, but we were thinking we would hope to have more than one facility, many facilities around the Great Lakes region. Um, so hopefully that would help in having enough room for the amount of polystyrene that we collect. Sorry, just to add on to what Aaron said as well. Um, also like, as Aaron said, there's a lot of things to consider into that. Um, and not just obviously the mealworms and the plastic, but also, um, any other factors contributing to the atmosphere of the actual facility. Cause we found with the research that like, there are factors like temperature and the density of the plastic alone that really do affect how quickly they're able to degrade and how, um, I guess, like how effective it would be in the first place. So those are also a few other things that you would have to consider when, yeah, when moving forward with that question. Great. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you, April. We're going to now move on to our next school. That is Spelman College. Let's roll the video. The action of Rosa Parks, the words and leadership of Martin Luther King Jr. inspired me to find a way to get in the way. And I got in trouble. Good trouble. Necessary trouble. In 2012, a 17-year-old Trayvon Martin was visiting his father in Sanford, Florida. During a short walk from the local store, Martin was stalked and gunned down by an ex-neighborhood watch captain, who was eventually tried and acquitted. This trial and result created a ripple of sadness and disappointment through the Black community. The Black community responded with the hashtag, I am Trayvon Martin, a social media protest campaign that featured celebrities and allies wearing hoodies. The outfit that was believed to have caused the profiling of this black boy walking through his neighborhood. Shortly after the acquittal of Martin's murderer, the phrase hashtag Black Lives Matter emerged on Twitter. This movement gained momentum as a social justice juggernaut that sought to center the disparity of threat to black lives in our society. The hoodie became a symbol of every person of color who had experienced racial profiling while simply existing. Subversive, biofashion for black lives. We began our project as part of an Afrofuturist speculative design process that concluded with inspiration from the Biodesign Challenge. Say goodbye to the wind by J.G. Ballard. We were challenged to find or create representations of ourselves in this dystopian future after further exploration of many variations of biodesigns to support black lives, we landed on our current project presentation. Our group was divided into three teams, materials, sensors and schema, and design, each supported by a Spellman faculty member within the discipline. This project features a speculative and critical wearable design that will integrate wearable sensors that can collect biometric data from the wearer. The individual data collected can be crowdsourced across urban landscapes and used by entities designed to provide therapeutic and protective response mechanisms. This biodesigned garment is meant to be a subversion of the hoodie, typically worn throughout the black community. Through our speculative upcycling of the typical hoodie, we envision an Afrofuturist wearable design to change the narrative of the social impact of wearing a hoodie while being black. We began our process using a variety of materials and processes in our iteration to find best examples of the ideas we wanted to express in this garment. Limitations of our isolated existence has made it difficult to explore many physical prototypes thinking about the material for our hoodie, we first explored the characteristics that we wanted our hoodie to possess. The first was physical protection. This desire led us to explore materials that resist force and pressure. Accordingly, the outer material is modular and comprised of a matter made of spider silk, silk leather from Tuft University's silk lab. This layer is rip, puncture and water resistant. However, the fabric for our hoodie is triple layered. 
The second layer, encased in the outer layer, is made of a compressed mixture of starch and water ublek, to create a polymer with non-Newtonian properties to encase the flexible electric components and provide the wearer with protection from blunt force trauma without sacrificing mobility. Finally, the inner layer is made of a removable conductive mesh that would connect the different modules together as a network. This part of the garment could be removed and can easily be washed. The various sensors within our hoodie measures a range of biometric data, including body temperature, heart rate, blood pressure, breathing rate, and it also provides an EEG of the wearer's brain when the hood of the garment is pulled up and over the wearer's head. This is all in an attempt to determine the wearer's state of well-being. The data obtained by the hoodie sensors with regard to body temperature, heart rate, breathing rate, and blood pressure will then be used to reflect the wearer's state of well-being in the arm and hand band of the hoodie such that a calm state is represented by blue, a nervous or slightly irritated state is represented by green, a fearful state is represented by orange, and panic attacks or cases of extreme fear are represented by red. The color changing aspect of the hoodie is premised on an if-then-else loop such that if certain biometric data, as measured by the sensors, falls within a specific range as stated in the code for the loop, the color of the hoodie's hand and arm bands change using LED motors as stated within the code reflecting the output for that range. We envision our design existing as an embodiment of historically rooted community connectivity. In the same way that the grapevine has been used to share community networks around sentiment, threat, and well-being, this hoodie would allow for members of the community to share and propagate data that would allow for support networks to engage as needed. Additionally, wearers would be, could be community members who are involved in various forms of engagement or activism, whether primary actors who are witnessing events of note or those who are secondarily engaged, the data can be encrypted and securely shared and sourced across landscape and utilized by local community organizers, leaders, and support structures who are providing care and support. According to the UN, conflict, insecurity, weak institutions, and limited access to justice remain a great threat to sustainable development. By respecting human rights in this time of crisis, we will build more effective and inclusive solutions for the emergency of today and the recovery for tomorrow. We believe that our subversive biodesign will afford Black communities the opportunity to create a more positive well-being among its members, specifically those facing threats of brutality and marginalization. We, the Spellman Biodesign team, would like to thank you for acceptance of our biowearable designed submission that seeks to support peace, justice, and inclusive societies as part of our commitment to Representative John Lewis's charge to find and embody necessary trouble. We found this work to be incredibly thought-provoking, as it challenged us to see ourselves in a society that promotes the well-being of Black lives. We'd like to thank our advisors and teachers for their support, and we thank you for your time. And we're back with the Spellman students. Thanks all for being here. Uh, great presentation. I'm looking forward to hearing questions from the judges. Kathy, you're for your first step. Thank you. Yes, and, and congratulations, you all. That was a really wonderful presentation. Um, I was really inspired by the by the project in general. Um, I, my question is around the the hoodie itself and things like you know how far did you get? With, I know this is a speculative project. I understand that. Plus, we're coming out of a pandemic, so those things probably affected your research. But how how much research were you able to actually do, kind of hands on? with the materials that you were describing that were embedded in the hoodie and you know what did that look like for you all i mean are there still questions you have etc cetera, etc cetera? um okay so i'll take this one thank you so much for having us and thank you so much for the question um we really weren't able to be as hands on as we would have liked to be just because we were completely remote this uh year so everything that we did was very speculative, um, but we were able to employ the help and the advice of computer science professors, of some professors from the Spelman Innovation Lab, just to get a sense of how everything would work so that we would be able to map it accurately. Um, as soon as we are all back on campus, we would love to actually be able to begin designing it physically. Great, thank you so much. 
Carrie, do you want to go ahead? I think Justice was next. Oh, Justice, I missed you. Go ahead, please. <laughs> no worries. Uh, really fantastic project. I really uh, appreciate the sort of social critique embedded in sort of your project presentation. I like the way you're using an artifact, a material artifact to sort of reframe a narrative that uh, is not only very relevant, um, but uh, so important in recent times, especially in the United States. I wondered though, uh, related to the biometric sort of pieces, which I think we've seen before um, in other uh, sort of designs, what would prevent uh, given this sort of community aspect of, of the data sharing, uh, someone like a uh, government institution from subverting the technology and leveraging it, say, for uh, nefarious reasons like uh, profiling uh, individuals on the basis of them uh, reacting, uh, quote unquote, suspicious, right? Which could really just be nervous. So could you comment a little bit about that? So that was one of our biggest issues when thinking about our hoodie and the technology and the communal aspect that we were discussing for this hoodie. And that is actually what we want to go into in the next stages of figuring out how to create this network that has this autonomy that's a, um, separate from these institutions because we know that in with these government institutions, they do um, utilize these networks that we all are available to and we all are connected to. So if we were to continue with this and say we got funding for this project, that is what our next stages of research would and but how to go about creating a network that our hoodie and our wearers can live within that's outside of the um, hands of government institutions. And that is a big issue that we are thinking about because we know that at the stage of what we're talking about right now, if we just went about connecting our hoodie to the networks that we have already in present day, that it, this technology definitely would be utilized in a negative connotation. And that's not what we want. So we, it's about the next stages of creating a whole new network that black people can feel safe and autonomous from the government. Thanks, Justice. Uh, Carrie, please go ahead. So Justice had my, <laughs> um, but uh, I also wanna say, yeah, this is a really, really cool project. And I particularly like the idea of the oobleck layer. I don't know, that's just really fun. Um, <laughs> Just adding on to Justice, uh, I was also just a little concerned about the hoodie, the color changes. Um, so beyond the network idea that like, I don't know, just someone in the area could like use that as a way to like identify someone who might be nervous already and, you know, like use them as a victim. Um, just wondering what you thought of that. And then just quick sub question because justice stole my main one um, was just about the sensors um i don't know much about what sensors are already available on the market could you talk about like are do you plan on using things that you know already exist or will you have to build a lot um like de novo thanks um okay so i can take this question um with regards to the latter half of the question so about the sensors we really plan to use um sensors that are already existing uh that have already been made so some of them are pressure matrices and we have some that measure heart rate so what we plan to do is find um small sensors that we can put at strategic parts of the body um to measure known uh, bodily reactions to specific emotions or expressions of specific emotions. Uh, we chose to do this just because, again, we weren't actually able to be physically present in the lab. So we just wanted to take what was already available to us um, and use it in the way that seemed uh, most appropriate. Um, and with regard, could you just remind me of the first part of your question, please? Oh, it was just sort of adding on to Justice's question about sort of nefarious uses and beyond sort of the bigger network 
idea of the the light up aspects of the hoodie that could be useful for the user but i was wondering what you thought about you know how others out and about could use that as a signal to like target someone um that was actually that's actually something that we didn't really consider when we uh created the hoodie but it's it's a wonderful uh, thing to think about. I think we majorly want the hoodie to be used uh, in times when we feel like it's important for us to see each other based on emotion and not physical presence so that we can interact with each other as humanely as possible. Um, so it would be the wearer's choice if they choose to wear their hoodie uh, in a context where, you know, maybe uh, an orientation day for college or something like that. Maybe just to break the ice, you could say, ah, your patch is orange, so am I, we're both nervous, ha, 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 um, something like that. Uh, but we we would hope, again, and that would be something that we can only really figure out uh, if it's feasible and if it's actually created. How does it change uh, societal interaction? Um, but we, we really wanted something that would allow people to connect to others in a more humane fashion, especially when we have uh, different, especially in different scenarios, like traffic stops, um, you know, meeting people, if you want to use it to be an icebreaker and so forth. Great. Thank you, Carrie, for the question. Uh, Jean, please go ahead. Um, I, just, I, I liked your project very much. Um, I have a couple questions, and it's kind of on where Carrie and Justice were. Um, when you have biometric data coming out of a sensor, I'm, my heart's racing right now because I'm online and I get nervous. So I, my question is, how do your sensors determine whether, you know, I'm just getting excited because I just saw my friend for a long time, or I'm getting excited because someone is being really aggressive to me? So that's one question I have. And then the other question I have, and it's related to the others, about privacy and like, how much I want to give over, how much the community I want the community to have. And the last thing I have to say is what I love about this project is you can have a historical um, like record of a community's emotions. And I think that's a really powerful thing. Um, and then, but that begs the question, who owns that data? And then how do we maintain that data? You, you answered some of those questions. Um, so maybe this is a community-based server, right? So like, I'm just, you know, throwing out a whole bunch of comments and questions. So I'm going to stop right now because we're going to run out of time. So the biggest question is how do we determine the data? Like if someone's in a bad place or is just a, in a good place and their heart rate is going off or whatever. Okay. Um, okay, Abigail, go ahead. Okay. So with um, this communal aspect and when it comes to the sharing of the data, there is you, there is an aspect where you're able to kind of share your location and with this communal aspect, so it's like within the context so that um, people will know, depending on the context of where you're at, they can try and gauge like what your emotion will be. Um, and also this, it, it comes into the, like the next stages of prototyping and figuring out what works and what does is when it comes to measuring the data, what gets misinterpreted with the data when it comes to actual user experience. And so um, that's why it's very important for us to have our hoodie be customizable. So users are able to choose what technology they they want to use in the certain situation that they are wearing the hoodie. So say you don't necessarily want to be part of like you, you get to choose how much you want to be a part of the community and who, what you share with the data with the community. And we really want the data to be autonomous so you get to choose how much you share and where it goes and who it goes to. Great. Thank you so much. We're out of time. We're going to move on to the next team. Thank you all. Uh, the next team up is from Fashion Institute of Technology. Hi Thank everyone, you. we're presenting Beat the Heat Movement for Fashion Institute of Technology and I'm Idil, my major is fashion design. I'm Chelsea and my major is home products development. I'm Sammy, my major is fashion design. My name is Isabella and I'm an international trade and marketing major.
Beat the heat movement is an idea that we created to beat the heat island effect in urban areas. So what is the heat island effect? According to, to the Environmental Protection Agency, it is a phenomenon that occurs when structures such as buildings, roads and other infrastructure absorb uh, and re-emit the sun's heat more than natural landscapes such as forests and water bodies. Connection between heat island effect and environmental racism. Here's an example of a correlation between heat and low income areas, showing poverty levels in Richmond. Lower income neighborhoods often experience the worst heat in the city. These areas are more, more vulnerable to a higher concentration of poverty and 911 calls for heat related illnesses. Also, higher temperatures in lower income neighborhoods, largely barren of trees and lower temperatures in more affluent uh, tree shaded areas. Across more than 100 cities, a recent study found that formerly red light neighborhoods are today 5 degrees hotter in summer on average than areas once favored for housing loans, with some cities seeing differences as large as 12 degrees. Redlined neighborhoods, which remain lower income and more likely to have black or Hispanic residents, consistently have far fewer trees and parks that help cool the air. They also have more paved surfaces, such as asphalt lots or nearby highways that absorb, radi absorb and radiate heat. Redlining is a racist housing discrimination policy in which black and brown communities were cut off from access to FHA-backed mortgages that enabled many white families to purchase homes and move into middle-class neighborhoods, according to modern-day redlining, the burden of underbanked and excluded communities in New York. Modern-day redlining entails fewer loans of black and brown borrowers, less access to bank branches, less access to lending for small businesses, and leads to gentrification and displacement of low-income communities of color. Some of our goals of our project are to use design to improve environmental, economic, and social conditions of communities systematically targeted by these racist policies and still paying the price. As you can see from the graph made by the NYC Department of Health, there's an undeniable direct correlation between Key Island, asthma rates, and redlining. The Upper East Side has a median household income of $136,560. There's an estimate of 39 cases of asthma per 10,000 residents, 6.2% of residents live in poverty, and 24.2% are people of color. East Harlem, a historic center of black culture, art, and music, has a medium income of $32,960. That is 53% less than the citywide median household income. There's an estimate of 580 cases per 10,000 residents, 34.3% of residents live in poverty, and 84.9% are people of color. Our project relates most directly to these three UN Sustainable Development Goals, good health and well-being, reduce inequalities, and sustainable cities and communities. We don't get to choose where we come from or what communities we're born into. Sustainable and multifaceted improvements are needed for people facing environmental problems who live in historically underserved communities, often neglected socially and economically. According to the U.S. Energy Information Administration, 30% of households in New York don't have any type of air conditioning system. Therefore, they become victims of the heat island effect. This is why we have to reduce the effects of the heat island effect and work together with nature instead of working against it so people have less energy-consuming cooling systems. What are possible solutions? This is a picture of the ideal city with possible applications in it. There are roads and pavements painted white to reflect sunlight instead of absorbing it. Green roofs and green walls to create natural cooling effect by the way of plants. Piezoelectric pavement. This was inspired from an innovation uh, which are pavements that generate electricity from footsteps. We modified this innovation into payments that generates ventilation underground and release it to the surface to cool down the city. Our additional contribution on the um, bottom right uh, is cactus shaped bus stops which create cooling effects all around the city. 
we decided to focus on bus stops because they can be found in every part of the city. Racial minority groups are more likely to take transit in the U.S. than white populations. And in New York, there are many parts of the city with only access to buses, not subways. Regions with higher levels of racial diversity tend to have higher levels of public transit ridership, according to the Arlington Transit Satisfaction Study. The busiest bus route, M15 Local, has an annual ridership of 14,513,186. We have selected two bus stops on this route, one in East Harlem and the Upper East Side. As you can see in the photo of the East Harlem bus stop, the lack of shade and flora exacerbates the heat island effect. With our research, we found that a cactus is able to reduce their absorption of heat using their structure and ability to store water. The ribs act as a shade for the surface of the plant and it enables them to stay cool in hotter climates. Mimicking the shape of the cactus has helped us develop our own design for bus stops that can be used in urban areas impacted by the heat island effect. This design is made to help minority groups who are more likely to ride buses stay cool while waiting for their ride. So how will this bus stop work? As I mentioned before, the shape of these bus stops will be inspired by the self-cooling cactus. These walls will store rainwater that comes in from the top of the design. When the ribs are filled with water, the pressure generated by solar panels will allow the water to move through the pipes inside large panels to the top. This will spark the transpiration process to occur and as a result, release the stored water as vapor. Using the design software Tinkercad, we are able to develop a conceptual layout for the bus stop. At this bus stop, there would be three separate standing structures inspired by the cactus shape and function, along with a separate traditional bus covering for those who need access to a larger space. The material used to create the bus stop is steel, which is 100% recyclable material and can be accessed easily. Lastly, the transparent sections of the bus stop would be made of glass, also a recyclable material. As you can see, the ribs will act as a wall that separates the bus riders. The bus riders would also be protected from rain or snow because of the circular roof placed on top. This roof will also function as the location where the transpiration process takes place. No matter where you are standing at this bus stop, you will be able to see when the bus is approaching because of the transparent glass. The biomimicry of the design also creates a more calm and beautiful space at the bus stops. And according to a study done on bus riders in Phoenix, Arizona, it has been shown to improve people's mood and make people feel cooler even if the temperatures are hot. According to Yale Climate Connection, how residents are included in decision making around the issue is a real systematic change. They emphasize the importance of an understanding of community's history, working with residents, and educating them on how these political processes work. These are all central ideas to making our project sustainable, and we'd like to work more with these communities in the future to integrate more components of local culture and history. To promote people's awareness about Hit Island Impact, we are going to make campaigns. Especially for those who are facing the issue of Hit Island Effect, we are going to place a bit of Hit Movement sign in the Cactus bus stop and put a QR code at the back of the sign. So people scan the QR code and the information will pop up on their phone. People also keep learning about it by following our social media. Educational playground that teaches parkour is about biomimicry. We pay homage to our original concept, which is a biomimicry of desert snail to create non-traditional homes that can offset the climate phenomenon. Playground is a public space for everyone from children to adults, which is a good place for educating and developing communities. In the playground, we are going to make a community history map and desert snail biomimic rides. Experience is a great educational way so children can feel much cooler temperatures inside the snow-shaped rides. How does snow shell playground rides work? Some desert snails can survive at temperatures of up to 50 Celsius. The surface of the shell will be white and act as a reflective surface. The curves in the shape's structure also allows the sun rays to reflect at different angles. There is a snail-like material at the base of the shape to create insulation. By the way of insulation, the heat coming from the ground will be reduced inside the shape. The circular shapes getting smaller allows air flow on top and reduces heat. We also put windows to create ventilation inside. So here is our conclusion.
Thank you for listening to our presentation. Welcome back to uh, day two of the Biodesign Challenge Summit. I'm here with uh, the students from Fashion Institute of Technology. Judges, please go ahead and uh, turn on your videos to ask questions. Go ahead, Laura. Yeah, that, that was a really wonderful presentation. And I love that the way that you're bringing the solution to the, the location where this problem already exists and providing people with relief and from the research you did, um, kind of seeing the significant impact it can have. I was wondering if you could talk more about the materials, um, especially with the playground. Um, you, you said snail-like materials. I wonder if you could expand upon that and if the, the material was solid or if it is uh, a porous material. Um, actually, we were thinking about mimicking the shape and like the structure of snails. So in that uh, desert snail, there is a there's like a material that is actually the snail itself under um, under the shell. So um, I, I'm not sure how to like mimic that material into an architectural piece. Uh, maybe we can like improve that in the future with working with architects. And for the uh, shell, we were thinking about uh, doing something with uh, recycled dry walls. So they can be accessible and also um, create ventilation easily inside too. Thank you. Elizabeth, please go ahead. Hi, thank you for your presentation. Um, it's exciting to see something uh, based in New York because that's also my the place I call home, <laughs> and and um, and so I'm wondering. Um, you know, it seems to me that your project, to implement your project, you would have to interact with a bunch of different city agencies, Department of Transportation, Department of Environmental Protection, probably the Parks Department also. Have you thought about what, what would those conversations look like if you had a DOT agent in front of you or a DEP agent in front of you? What would you tell them? Um, and how, what do you think uh, were, would the incentives be for these city agencies to wanna work with you? Um, I will answer your question. Thank you for asking that question. Uh, basically our incentive our kind of like a proposal when talking to these other agencies would be like, this is gonna benefit the communities, these underdeserved, underrepresented communities, especially we talk about East Harlem a lot. And East Harlem is a historically very black and brown neighborhood. And instead of, there's a lot of rhetoric of, well, why don't these people move to a better place? Well, not everyone has that privilege to, not everyone can afford to do that. So um, my proposal or our group's proposal would be, we wanna improve the existing communities so they have a improved livelihood. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Jean, you're the last question. We're, we're almost out of time. Okay, I'm just going to quickly follow up. During the process when you were designing, did you reach out to anyone in the communities, like a community center or anybody's grandpa or somebody, um, to get like a sense of the strategies that people already use to beat the heat and heat inversion in cities? So I actually tried contacting the environmental, the environmental climate justice organization in New York. I didn't, we didn't get a response back. And I tried contacting actually the author of this book, Harriet Washington, a terrible thing away. So it talks about environmental racism and it's uh, why it contributes to the IQ gap in the United States. And so we wanted to talk to them, but unfortunately we didn't get a response in time. However, in the future, we will pursue more community interaction and Honestly, we are open to any criticism because our project, it's made to benefit these communities. It's not for us. It's meant, it's meant for the communities who want to help. Uh, yeah, and quickly, I think I, I'm glad to hear that because I do think that you need to talk to some people. Maybe not. I think it's really important to what Elizabeth brought, pointed out, sort of city officials. 
But as we know from many projects that have failed in New York City, it a lot has to do with how people in the community feels about it. And it would be nice to that you would have done some work to kind of figure out a, a priority. Uh, is a bus stop a priority to the community? You know, like, or is the plague, you know, so that you could really focus your efforts. Um, so if this is going to go forward, I would suggest that you go up to East Harlem um, and just walk the streets and see, talk to the hair, you know, the hairdressers and the, you know, the grocery store yes. owners and the people in the community to get a good read on what, how they be, how, how they're dealing with these issues and what they would want you to do. Of right. course, yes. Um, we, unfortunately, we all aren't located in New York. Um, several of us, actually one of our group mates is in Turkey. Only a few of us are in New York. So in the future, hopefully we'll be able to be in New York and actually work on the field and, and do in-person communication. I feel like that might be more effective versus um, we want to do a survey, but we're afraid that everyone, the people we wanted to speak to the most wouldn't have access to the technology to complete the survey. So I think it might be better for in the future to us actually get on foot and go and actually talk to people in person. Right. Thank you for that thought, Isabella. Thank you, Jane, for the question. Yeah, thank, thank you for your suggestions. Yes. Thank you so much for the questions. Thank, thank you. you. All right, we're going to move on now. Um, we are on the last team uh, of this session, and that is Universidad del Istmo. So let's roll it. Thank you. Good morning. This is our Biodesign Challenge project for Universidad del Istmo, Guatemala. Before we start, let us introduce ourselves. My name is Lisa Andreu. My name is Michelle Berganza. My name is Jose Andres Lopez, and we are senior architecture students from Universidad del Istmo in Guatemala City. And now we present our very own Balbush. Boo what? I know. It is a very exotic word, don't you think? But believe me, Balbush is a real word. In Quiche, one of our largest indigenous languages in Guatemala, this word means source and it's pronounced as bulb bush. Like if you combine a light bulb and a bush. Bulb bush. So first, I want to introduce you to Guatemala and open up the question about what's the first thing you think about when someone mentions this country. Do you see any of your thoughts here? Probably. These are some of the most mentioned characteristics of Guatemala, especially since we are so-called the country of eternal spring. But it is important to emphasize that this might not be entirely true, or at least for a significant part of our territory. So, starting from the bigger picture, Central America is located over here. A large fraction of its territory is the Dry Corridor, a dry extension of land that for years has suffered from the effects of climate change. Harsh droughts have caused the crops to be lost and the population is dying of hunger. As a result, poverty and food deprivation is growing as much as this corridor. If we see the numbers, it is almost impossible to avoid that poverty and food insecurity is directly related to the effect of climate change in this region. Zooming into Guatemala, the effects of the drought impact directly on the nutritional quality of the population. Let's emphasize that one out of two kids in Guatemala suffered from food deprivation which has a negative effect on body and brain development. According to Oxfam, 821 million people around the world suffer from chronic food deprivation. Guatemala is not an exception. This deadly pattern repeats. Climate change causes the drought. The drought causes lost crops. And as a result, lost crops cause poverty and hunger. So, our strategy is the adaptation to natural disasters and risks related to climate change, linked to the 13th Sustainable Development Goal. Take urgent action to combat climate change and its impacts. So, 
We are from this Guatemala. As much as from this one. And that's exactly what drives us here. Our fight to reduce the damage of climate change in Guatemala's nutrition. Targeting especially the low quality nutrition and lack of food product diversity in the dry corridor of Guatemala. And that's why we created the superfood, a nutritional experiment based on fungi that can substantially nourish our most affected families. If you remember, two years ago, corn cove leaves were presented as a fabric for clothing. Now beans are used as a superfood. This way we're taking advantage of the most relevant crops in Guatemala, which are part of our Mayan culture. Mayans also use fungi for medical purposes and believe they were a connection between them and their gods. A fusion of these agricultural elements makes our superfood, using beans and tempeh to make the most nutritious tamale. And why a tamale? You see, tamales are a big part of Guatemalan culture, and we want to make something that people can identify with. They are made from corn or rice dough, filled with meats, vegetables, sauces, and other ingredients. How will we make this happen? Easy. First, we grow the fungus that makes tempeh, which is called Rhizopus oligosporus. This process starts by choosing a particular substrate, which can be a mix of, for example, coffee grounds, sawdust, and herbs. This will be the foundation for the crop. Then, the substrate is boiled for one and a half hour. When it's done, the substrate is drained so the ground is humid. The substrate is mixed with a seed miscellated with Rhizopus oligosporus, the tempest starter. This can be stored in breathable bottles or boxes up to 2 liters of volume or more. These containers are placed in a clean, ventilated and dark room. After 20 days, the fungus will have colonized all of the substrate. After that time, the containers are placed for 12 hours in the fridge, a cool place or underground. This will help to make the fungus grow faster. Now, the containers need a controlled atmosphere with high humidity for the fungus to finish growing. This can be done in a homemade greenhouse or a cultivation chamber. Time to harvest! But before that's done, it's important to make sure the fungus is ready by observing the outline of it. It should be a smooth curve, not a strong one. They can be stored in the fridge so it lasts up from 10 to 15 days. With these 8 easy steps, the fungus for the tempe is done. Next, the spores are collected and dried. This is known as the tempe starter. Then, it's blended into cooked local black beans for the fermentation process. After 48 hours, it's ready. Then, it can be seasoned and cooked according to what type of tamales you want to make. This superfood is vegan, gluten-free and organic, making it the most nutritious tamale ever. And now, I'm going to explain to you how our idea will grow and develop. For this, it's necessary to consider that it will be divided into scales, the product, productivity and distribution. The product. The objective on this scale is to immediately provide the product to the person who needs it. And what will the process be like? The person may go to the entities that will collaborate in the process or in the cultivation centers. These centers will be shown later, but it will be there where they will have access to the prepared tamale. Productivity. On this scale, it will be possible to benefit a larger group of people, such as a family, for example. And the process will work as follow. Similar to the scale above, the families approach to the entities or the cultivation centers and they will be given a kit. The kit will contain all necessary equipment for the creation of tempe, along with its recipe. This will help people to prepare their own tamale at home. As I mentioned earlier, inside the kit we can find two recycled bottles, the recipe, a wooden mortar, two bags of mushroom mycelium, and one package of beans. The objective is to provide food to 1.6 million people affected by the drought. So we will multiply that amount by the unit value of the kit, obtaining 
an approximate value of $9.6 million necessarily to be able to provide good food to all those people who have lost everything. How would the process work? First, we must have recycled cardboard boxes. Then, we will group all necessary equipment together with the recipe. Next, we proceed to put it in the box and sale it. We will take the box to the dome where it can have optimal conditions. After that, the kit will be provided to the families who need it. Distribution Only the corresponding entities will be in charge of this stage, since the product will be exported to the most affected areas by food insecurity caused by drop. The product will be cast and cultivated in domes for future export. The dome will be built with wood and ceramic, which will allow for thermal comfort inside. This dome is planned as a second phase of the project. To close this final chapter, why are we, three architecture students, working with this fungi? In architecture, we are used to the word design, always focused in building construction, materials, measurements, and more, but its meaning is far beyond. But once we put the prefix bio in front of it, a world of possibilities start to appear. We are no experts in this matter, but our quest for change is our motive. So we are three architects, one prefix, and 1.6 million people who need you and me to defy the right. Would you join us? Welcome back, everyone. We're here with the students. Uh, judges, we're open for questions. Well, I'm hungry for now, <laughs> for one. That looked delicious. Elizabeth, go ahead. Hi, thank you for your presentation. Um, so my understanding is that you're, you know, you're designing a food production system for the for the for the the dry environment right the environment that is otherwise barren for production um, so I have a couple of questions one uh, what are what is the resource consumption that you imagine in this kind of alternate um, production system like where is everything coming what is your water usage etc um, and second is how do you see the dome structure that you propose to house this in interacting with the rest of the environment? Um, if you could speak a little bit to those two points. Okay, um, I think I can answer the first uh, part of the question. Thank you. Um, well, we haven't as, as the video uh, was explaining, we didn't uh, get to uh, have the, the time for um, experimenting, right? The, uh, of making a distamali, uh, but the consumption consumption of the ingredients that would be included in this tamale would be local. Um, here in Guatemala, we have a lot of uh, agricultural uh, culture, <laughs> so it's easy to find uh, black beans in almost every. Uh, department here in, in the country and uh, also would be uh, water um, from the local um, rivers that go across um, all the country. So we have to, we, we, would, we would have to uh, research more uh, about that. But yeah, that's, that's the idea. And then I think Jose can answer the other part of the question. Thank you. Yeah, can you hear me? Okay, uh, about the, the construction of the, the domes, those uh, materials uh, were uh, quote with different suppliers in order to set a price, uh, taking into consideration that it's a uh, low cost, uh, but it might be more feasible to contact with uh, recyclers to get the box uh, and, and the bottles for the kit and for the dome. Um, the the materials uh, were manufactured in in the site, um, and location is one of the uh, factors uh, we need to to take uh, attention uh, because this um, 
will um, uh, <laughs> sorry say uh, we need to take into consideration uh, that the project can be located anywhere that uh, suffered from the problem of drought. Thank you. Uh, Kathy, please go ahead. Yes, hi, you all. And um, I, my, I appreciate what you're, you were just talking about um, and the question that Elizabeth just asked, but I also want to follow up on um, kind of the, the idea of where the, whose hands this is going into in the end. I mean, I understand the, the domes will be a kind of intermediate space where the product would be possibly grown and or it could be done in somebody's home. But have you, have you been able to speak with any people who might be in these various communities that you're imagining sending this material to, or maybe you're in these communities? I don't know where you're situated specifically um, within the country, I mean. And so just how, how much research were you able to do with those, um, not just product lines, which you did outline, but also you know receivers of the goods and whether they feel that they are capable of handling growing the materials themselves or getting to and from these centers given their life's lives and what they have on their plates. Yeah, I would like to answer this question. Thank you, Kathy, for it. Um, the communities of many of these uh, places they um, they are really open to this kind of of, of new proposals, uh, especially because they they need the help and and they they are open to um, to find new solutions. Uh, we have got to see many uh, testimonies of of these communities. We didn't get to to be there physically, which is uh, maybe a better mechanism of communication with them and. Um, but within the project and the design, we, we went through many uh, other dishes, for example, uh, thinking like the tempeh is like so, um, so friendly to many other uh, practices in gastronomics. But we thought that the tamale, uh, because of being so cu uh, culturally accepted, might be um, an easier way for us to get to the communities and to tell them uh, that it's a better way to cultivate and, mm -hmm. and and there's a better way to um, to get those uh, resources and nutritional uh, benefits. So, um, unfortunately, because of the pandemic and because of many other things, we uh, the three of us don't live in in this specific uh, places uh, because they are far away from the from the city. However, um, it's a, a following step. Whenever we get the chance to be with them and speak to them will uh, do it. However, um, and this uh, Jose you might be able to help me, we got to make a, a research of the entities that we mentioned in the video that might be able to get a, a better, um, I don't know, um, following of the, of the process with the communities or at least uh, with a faster kind of um, process. Thank you so much. We're out of time. So um, thank you, Universidad del Istmo. That was great. Thank you, Kathy, for your question. And thank you to the rest of the judges. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Um, before we go to break, I have an update for everyone. I checked out our Kickstarter page. We are now two thirds of the way towards our goal, which is amazing. Thank you, everyone. And just two days, we are almost there. If you haven't gone and checked out the Kickstarter page, please go ahead and take a look. Uh, we made an adorable video that I hope you'll enjoy. We also um, are doing pre-sales of the book, so please do have a look. Um, it's always a pleasure to, to, to be here with you and serve this community. Um, and now I will take, we're gonna take a 15 minute break and we'll be back with our next judging session. Thank you so much. In a world where plastic rules all, 90% of toys are made of some sort of unrecyclable plastic. Our brave biomaterial rebels, Fungus and Scooby, have come to save our planet. Together, they will battle the evil forces of plastic. But wait, they can't do it alone. Join their mission of ridding the world of plastic, one BioBuddies kid at a time. We're the BioBuddies!
Our mission is to provide you with eco-friendly toy kits to explore, play, grow, and create with biomaterials. As the world is becoming more aware of environmental sustainability, it's time to move away from plastic. This is where biomaterial design comes in to save the day. Our biomaterial growing kit incorporates science, nature, and art to make biodesign more approachable. We've designed two biomaterial growing kits, Scooby and Fungus. Scooby is a kombucha growing kit, and Fungus is a mycelium kit. Each kit includes the necessary supplies to grow the biomaterial and explore with it. The average toy fad lasts eight months. Our goal is to create a sustainable kit that can be played with, explored, and developed to sustain interest over a long period of time. The entire exploration journey cycle is accessible, educational, and fun. We tap into the waste stream by feeding our cultures with used coffee grounds, sugary drinks, and tea leaves. First, users grow their biomaterials. Then they can play and explore through personalized projects with their materials. Of course, not all projects will succeed so we encourage users to celebrate their fails. In the future, we hope that we can sell our kits online or even in retail stores like Target to people of all ages. As our kits don't fit into a specific category, we think that they would best fit into the craft or miscellaneous kit aisle. Help us save the earth by redesigning the toy industry. Bio, Bio Buddies out! Majo.
잘하면 딸들도 요리 잘하거든? 그래서 우리 외할머니가 요리를 진짜 잘하셨고 우리 이모도 요리를 진짜 잘하셨어 글쎄, 아마 타고났겠죠, 손맛은. 자기가 뭐 태어날 때부터, 그죠? 자기가 좋은 손맛을 가지고 있다는 거는 좋은 재산을 가지고 있는 거랑 마찬가지잖아요. 
ฉันกลายเป็นคนเศร้ามองฉันต้องเหมือนคนทิ้งใจใช่ถึงกินว่าย Hi, I'm Dan. I'm Vina. I'm Alex. And I'm Emma. And we're the team behind BioDesign Challenge. We want your help to publish our first ever book, BioDesign Challenge: A Retrospective. BDC is an international education program and competition that's shaping the first generation of biodesigners. We pair high school and university students with artists, designers, and scientists to envision, create, and critique transformational applications in biotechnology. Our projects have gone on to show in museums and galleries around the world, and many have served as inspiration for new companies. The book will be a full-color celebration of work produced by the BDC community over the last five years. It will feature 28 projects that bridge art, design, and biotechnology. Not only will it include essays by our alumni, but perspectives from eminent practitioners in the field. Newcomers will find a primer on biodesign and how it's shaping the future of sustainability. For those already familiar, the book will offer insights from thought leaders, including biologist Paul Fremont, curator William Myers, and many others. It'll also include a foreword by Paula Antonelli, senior curator of architecture and design. At MoMA, BDC has collaborated with organizations including Science Sandbox, the National Endowment for the Arts, the Parsons School of Design, and the Museum of Modern Art, where we hold our annual summit. We are publishing the book in partnership with the University Science Center in Philadelphia. So, if you're interested in learning more about innovative and fascinating topics, Or if you just want to be awesome and support the next generation of bio designers, then this book is for you. Every pledge, no matter how big or small, helps bring us closer to our goal. Thank you for your support. We can't wait to share the retrospective with you. Welcome back, everyone. We're here to continue. We're going to continue our presentations in just one moment. Uh, first, a few reminders. So, if you have not checked out our Miro board yet, our community whiteboard, we hope you do. Um, and also, uh, if you would, are you, sh if you're sharing things on social media, photos, videos, uh, gifts, whatever it may be, please tag us at BioDesigned past tense um, and use the hashtag BDC2021. Um, and please do check out our Kickstarter campaign page uh, to pre-order BDC's first book, which is a celebration of the first five years of the challenge. You can find all of this information just right below if you're watching it on the BDC Summit page. Um, all the information should be on that page just below. So now we're going to go right into it. So our next two teams are finalists for another one of our sponsored prizes, which is the Science Sandbox Prize for Public Engagement. This prize encourages students to create projects that amplify public discussion about the multitude of impacts of biotechnology um, and, uh, that biotechnology can have on society. So thank you Science Sandbox, an initiative of the Simons Foundation for your continued support of BDC and of our students. Um, we'll have program and media officer, John Tracy, who's gonna join us as a judge today. Um, so without further, oh, our two finalists for that prize is University of Southern California and the Nest Makerspace. So without further ado, we're gonna start with our video from University of Southern California. Take it away, Jeff. Hello, everyone. This is Past Futures, a podcast where we explore the events of the second millennium that have shifted the course of the future. I'm your host, Zoe Vosley. It is April 28, 2080, and in today's episode, we will be talking with historian Dr. Anna Mangino and Dr. Andrea Binz, a world-renowned spongiologist, in order to understand the role that a humble organism, the sponge, played in alleviating the Los Angeles arsenic crisis an event that laid the groundwork for the global reforms in the second half of the 21st century that mitigated global climate change and instituted the global circular economy that addressed issues of waste, resource scarcity, and extreme socioeconomic inequality. 
The early 21st century, also known as the Carbon Age, was defined by environmental degradation and the devastating impacts of carbon emissions. In the western United States, California took most of the climate blow. Beginning in 1999, Southern California was plunged into a mega drought that never fully let up, causing groundwater stocks to be overpumped, releasing small amounts of arsenic into the water supply. In the late 2020s, the drought reached a new extreme, and Southern California had its lowest annual rainfall in recorded history. In 2028, Amazon Industries swooped in amidst Los Angeles' financial crisis and purchased nearly all of the city's utilities, including the water system, opening the floodgates for the privatization of major urban utilities nationwide. Many of us have likely learned about this crisis through the statistics. Over 5 million people out of a population of 11 million suffered arsenic poisoning in the Los Angeles County area alone. Bottled water was in such short supply that low-income communities had little choice but to use contaminated water for daily necessities. But what really led to this crisis? And how did it shape the world we live in today? Now, historian Dr. Anna Mangino is joining us. Anna, what was life like in Los Angeles in the year 2030? Hi, Zoe. Thank you for having me. So great to talk with you today. Beginning in 2030, illegal overpumping of groundwater released critical concentrations of arsenic into the Los Angeles water supply. By March of that year, increases in the incidence rates of many types of cancer and acute symptoms of arsenic poisoning led to civil unrest. Families of those suffering from the first wave of poisoning sought answers. Powerful members of Amazon Industries were revealed to have knowledge about the unsafe levels of arsenic as far back as 2028. However, they did nothing to warn the public about the risks. There was worldwide panic. It became clear that private businesses who had purchased water companies in the peak of their regulation in the 2020s had tampered with testing systems to hide widespread issues related to water contamination. I'd like to share an archival audio clip from a live stream recorded by a journalist from April 2030 that illustrates the fear and confusion people felt at that time. We are live in downtown Santa Monica. Third Street Promenade is unrecognizable as the Los Angeles water wars continue. There is looting in every store in the area as people frantically search for clean water. Protests have continued for 30 days as people take out their frustrations on corporations that have placed profit over moral standards. Amongst the burning buildings and blaring sirens, water scalpers are eagerly holding informal auctions, selling individual bottles of water to the highest bidder, with prices reaching $1,000 per bottle. I am now approaching one member of a crowd surrounding one of these auctions. Hi, I'm currently live streaming what is happening here today. Is this your first time going to a water auction? No, I have been here every week, but it's getting too expensive. I don't know what to do next. I'm a single parent and I've practically spent my entire life savings so my kids can survive. No one knows what to do. Everyone is turning to the water black market, but I don't even know if this water is clean enough. If I had more money, I would have skipped town like everyone else who could afford it. Following Operation Periphera, the U.S. government and several corporations sponsored a race to harness the abilities of a freshwater sponge that could neutralize arsenic. Leaders from around the world began opening their minds to nature-based solutions to not only the arsenic crisis, but to other social environmental crises as well. Thank you, Anna. On the note of Operation Periphera, we've invited Dr. Andrea Bins, a spongiologist whose research on the usage of sponges in large-scale water purification processes and bioremediation is based on the legacy of the groundbreaking discoveries made 50 years ago. Andrea, from a scientific perspective, can you explain to our listeners the discovery and invention that brought the arsenic crisis to an end? Thank you so much for having me on the show, Zoe. So, ongoing water quality monitoring following revitalization efforts by the Los Angeles River Master Plan revealed that the river actually had a decreasing baseline of arsenic over time. In 2027, a team of researchers from Southern California were surprised to identify a thriving population of Spongilla lacustris, a freshwater sponge, for the first time in the river. Downstream of the triad of wastewater treatment plants in Los Angeles, Burbank, and Glendale that provided a constant flow in the channel even in drought, Spongilla lacustris had essentially adopted a novel endosymbiont which in this case was a mutualistic bacteria later named Candidatus arsenophilium for its ability to absorb and mineralize arsenic, negating its toxicity to organisms that may eat the sponge or drink the water it lives in. Operation Periphera received its name from this discovery. As the crisis began unfolding, research groups started working around the clock to see how the unique arsenic neutralizing capacity of the sponge could be harnessed to make up for a shortage in traditional reverse osmosis filtration systems. Companies from around the country were tasked with harnessing this ability of the sponge 
to create an affordable, easily distributable product to help struggling Angelinos. Ultimately, in late 2030, Spongia, a company founded by the same team of researchers who had discovered the arsenic neutralizing capabilities of Spongilla lacrystris, created the first sponge-based filtration system. It was first distributed in January 2031 to low-income households that suffered the highest rates of cancers and arsenic poisoning symptoms. In layperson's terms, can you tell us how the technology of Spongia worked? In a nutshell, the Spongia filtration device included a habitat for Spongilla lacustris and a simple bioreactor to grow photosynthetic plankton to feed the sponge. Once the sponge mineralized the arsenic over 24 hours, the water would dispense to a holding tank where it was treated with UV light and then households could safely use that water. These systems were amazingly efficient. This species can filter water at a rate of 70 times its size per hour, so just a one cubic inch sponge could filter enough water to cover the basic cooking and drinking needs of a family of four. Perhaps Anna can speak to this. To my knowledge, it took more than these filtration systems for people to feel safe again. Yes, this trust in both government and corporation was so high that some people destroyed their sponges when they first received them. They feared they were part of a plot to control people's minds or further poison them. It sounds ridiculous, but when you consider the social conditions that led to the arsenic crisis in the first place, it is not unreasonable that these communities initially feared the solution to their problem. The turning point was actually when a group of activists began cultivating sponges in the Los Angeles River. They started creating their own filtration systems based on the open source patents for the Spongia filter. While Spongia created a top-down solution for the crisis, it was ultimately the bottom-up grassroots movement that gave communities the confidence and autonomy to confront the crisis themselves. Interesting. Andrea, can you speak to how the sponge filtration system was distributed around the world? The unique thing about this particular filtration system was that, of course, sponges are living, growing organisms, so they actually increase their capacity as they grow over time. And sponges can be easily divided for propagation. You can even separate the cells by grading them over a sieve, and they will aggregate and reorganize into new individuals within hours. Furthermore, as Spongilla lacustris exists naturally throughout the Asian, European, and North American continents, it was easy for international communities suffering from similar water quality issues to share in culture progeny of the LA River sponges hosting C. arsenophilium. All they needed were a few starter cells and training to build their own filtration systems. Bangladesh, which had suffered from a languishing public health crisis of arsenic-contaminated well water since the turn of the millennium, was a particular success story. With a few adaptations, this easily replicable technology gave villages and cities the ability to take public health back into the hands of communities and families. What you started seeing next was a global popularization of nature-based solutions. As the sponges cared for people by providing them with clean water, people fed and cared for the sponges. It brought a remote creature that most people never realized even existed into a place of particular importance in their homes and everyday lives. Now, nearly all of our technology is turning towards nature-based solutions in some way or another, from passive ventilation systems inspired by termite mounds to the mangrove forest that keeps seawaters at bay. Learning about the pivotal moments that triggered this transformation away from the anthropocentric mode of thinking that destroyed much of the natural world in the 20th and early 21st centuries It is a reminder that our current day is covered in the fingerprints of the past and that the future is currently being shaped by the present. As the actions of scientists, activists, and leaders mattered in deploying the solution to the 2030 arsenic crisis, each of us has the power to act today to change the future of humanity. Thank you to our guests, Dr. Anna Mangino and Dr. Andrea Binns, for their contributions to today's episode. Thanks again for having me on the show. Of course. Thank you for inviting me and until next time. Stay tuned for our next installment on the final decades of the 21st century. Thanks for listening. All right. Um, Wonderful job, USC. We're going to jump right into questions. So if judges, any of you have a question, um, you can turn your video on. All right, Naomi, let's start with you. Well, that was wonderful. Uh, The podcast format really works, doesn't it? Um, Yeah, great job. I want to know about the um, scientific background of this project. It's a very interesting uh, point of view to focus on sponge for arsenic uh, bioremediation. And uh, you mentioned the scientific article, which was published in 
published in 2027, so yet to come. So where did this um, inspiration come from? Uh, was there any kind of um, a scientific literature um, um, that you based your project upon? Or is it more of a sort of a uh, imaginary idea? If so, why sponge? Can you elaborate a little bit? <laughs> Hi Naomi, thank you so much for your question and um, to all the panelists today. So this is based on real research. Uh, there has been a study in the past few years from Tel Aviv University uh, that was published in Nature Communications. And so they were looking at a um, sea sponge which uh, hosts a bacteria that's called Entotheonella. And this bacteria actually is capable of mineralizing the toxic elements uh, of arsenic and transforming them to biologically inert products within its cells. So these sponges actually become non-toxic even if they're consumed by turtles or, or worms, they're natural predators, um, despite having a billion times more arsenic uh, than the surrounding seawater. The lab is still researching the mechanisms um, to understand how this uh, works. So this provided the initial inspiration. Uh, we made a strategic choice uh, to instead look at a freshwater sponge um, which is uh, also existing, called spongula lacustris. Um, since the process of desalination of water would be extremely resource intensive if we were to continue looking at the use of this real sponge, um, which is a marine sponge, we decided instead to uh, imagine a bacteria that convergently evolved um, in this freshwater sponge. Okay. Um, let's move on to Hank. Whenever you're ready, Hank. Uh, make sure you unmute yourself. First. Ah, yes. First time this week. <laughs> New record. It's Tuesday, I think. Uh, this was really clever. I really enjoyed this. Um, and you answered a bit of my uh, questions and with a previous person. I'm not quite sure. The, the arsenic continues to be in the sponge, but it's put in a way that it's, it's chemically combined in a way that makes it not biologically um, accessible to any organism that takes it in? Is, is that what you're doing with the arsenic? Is that what the Tel Aviv people found with the arsenic? Yes, correct. So I'll, I have to limit the, uh, acknowledge the limits of my own understanding of chemistry. And I would refer you, um, if you're interested to learn more about this process to the, the research that's been taking place. So our website, um, a link for our project website, which I also recommend um, for our, any of our viewers or the panelists to, to explore. You can see the URL in the uh, top corner of our screens. And it's also available through USC's um, web page through the Biodesign Challenge. So we have a pretty extensive annotated bibliography uh, on that website. And I would recommend um, anyone interested to learn more about the scientific processes uh, behind our, our project to, to take a look at that. So I would think that the possible reactivation of that arsenic, I mean, the arsenic isn't going to be destroyed. It's an element that's going to be there. That is a risk issue that if one were to take this seriously, you'd, you'd have to think more seriously about it. Maybe that the sponge puts it in a non-biologically accessible context for a while, but that might change. I guess the other question I had is, did you guys give any thought to the possible role of genetic engineering in this. You've got this nice DS6 machina and that you've got the DSX, DSX bacteria and that you've got this nice bacterium that uh, concentrates the arsenic and, and happens to be able to be a symbiote with the sponge. Uh, what if you don't? Or what if there are things other than arsenic that you wanna take out of water? Did you give any thought? And how would that play into your idea of a revival of, of uh, nature as a way of dealing with human problems. Definitely. I think those are great questions. And I think if we were to further explore the, I, the spongia itself, those are things we would have to further explore. And I think the research itself is in a very recent stage. The paper was published in 2017. Um, but I would say, though, thinking about our project as a whole, we were aiming more so to take a speculative approach at critiquing um, current events. So for instance, we were very inspired by how, um, by the global rollout of the COVID-19 vaccine and thinking about the inequity surrounding that. 
So within our project, through utilizing transmedia forms of narrative and storytelling, we were aiming to um, think about how to critique kind of the current day and also draw attention to the arsenic water crisis, which is one that currently affects 140 million people worldwide. And so, yes, well, I definitely think that these questions surrounding the precise scientific mechanisms of the spongia itself are very important and things that we would work out if we were interested in further developing the product itself. I think our focus more so as a project was to look at this means of storytelling as a form of communication, critique, and engagement with people. Wonderful. Um, in the interest of time, we're just gonna do one more question from John Tracy. Go ahead, John. Hey, great job all. That was uh, super interesting and thought provoking. I think I um, was really kind of clinging to this idea of grassroots and obviously that's um, something that you hear a lot in kind of like social movement contexts. And I love the idea of uh, looking at science and the democratization of science through that lens. Um, so when you mentioned that, do you see this as a kind of um, at least part, like a citizen science endeavor? Uh, I imagine, you know, like with the, it, it, obviously it's a, a more on the speculative design side and you didn't get too, too much in the science, but um, yeah, maybe you could talk us through that a little bit. Definitely. Um, I think something that we were very interested in critiquing and exploring was a world where solutions were not necessarily formulated and kept by corporations and companies, but were distributed and shared and adapted to different cultural and community contexts. And yeah, I would say a regret of ours while developing this project was that we did not get to um, communicate with people who are directly facing arsenic contamination. And I think that moving forwards, if we were to further develop this project, thinking about ways that we could directly work with community organizations who have a strong understanding of the human impacts of issues like climate change and environmental degradation. So issues like water contamination and further develop this project as a series of podcasts or some other form of um, media that would utilize similar methods that we used in this project to engage people on these issues and um, create conversation, but also um, use it as a jumping off point to start conversations and developing solutions to problems like this. So I definitely think that um, both in our project, we feature community empowerment via bottom-up solutions, but also moving forward, that's something that we think is a point of um, potential in our project as well to stimulate that in real life. If we just have a moment, I'd love to add, um, you know, this is a really important focus why we chose this kind of DIY approach was that we imagined that individuals across the world would contribute their own ingenuity, their own locally specific materials and technology into the development of Spongia. Wonderful answers, team, and wonderful questions, judges. We're going to move on to the next team, which is uh, Nest Makerspace Biotech Palotero Cart. Whenever you're ready, Jeff. Who is missing from the table in biodesign and sustainable agricultural discussions? Agricultural communities and the youth of these communities. Biotech Baletero Cart, accessible biodesign education, multi-generational learning on the streets and in the parks. Hello, we are a team of high school students from the Salinas area in Monterey County of California. We have been meeting remotely with the Nest Maker Space on Saturdays since January. We all attend Alsa High School in Salinas. The problem, ag worker communities need access to entry points to learn about the biodesign and contribute to ideas for sustainable ag tech. We aim to create a fun and accessible opportunities for our community to learn about biodesign so they can envision a sustainable agriculture future for themselves and the world. The skilled technologist who has also a deep crow knowledge is a unicorn because there are so few. In our community of Alice of Salinas, we need biodesign education. We have none in our school. It is really important we have this education because we are directly impacted by biotech and ag, ag tech. Our community is surrounded by agricultural fields and pesticide usage. Who are we in Salinas? We are the salad bowl of the world. We feed our nation. Total ag economic impact is eight billion per year. Crops grown in Monterey County supply the large percentages of total national pounds produced per year. 61% of leaf lettuce, 57% of celery, 56% of head lettuce, 48% of broccoli, 38% of spinach, 30% of cauliflower, and 28% of strawberries. In our community of Alas Salinas, the median income is 54,000. 
one in five households relies on income related to agriculture. Median age is 30 years, 31% under 18 years old. Our solution was informed by two surveys. The first was the bio plus food plus tech form conducted by the Salinas Community Biolab Ginapa and Tech Interactive. It surveyed teens on how they wanted to be taught about biodesign. The results show that local teens wanted to focus on food systems, field workers, hands-on activities, connections to art, computer science, social justice, and gardening. Here's the data from the AgroStyle team's Instagram survey of 76 participants. AgroStyle is the other Salinas BDC team. It reinforces our intent to create multi-generational accessible programming. The results show that the community believes agricultural workers and the elderly need to be included in sustainability agricultural conversations. Based on this information and our own brainstorming, we decided to make a biotech palatero cart to share biodesign activities with the people on the street and in the parks. In our community, a palatero cart represents sweet childhood moments, playful connection on neighborhood streets, and it's a space of trust. It is a good way to bring new conversations to communities. We believe our agricultural community of Alice and Salinas needs a fleet of palatero carts sharing biodesign education so our community can open its eyes to biotechnology and be empowered to be the first generation of its use in our Salinas Valley. We created a biotech palatero cart and conducted a pilot program in Atividad Creek Park. We enjoyed participating and collaborating with city and community organizations. This was the very first public community event in, in the park this year. We participated in the space with local urban gardeners, downtown streets team, Salinas Valley Recycling, and City of Salinas and Monterey County. Algae string. We had a biomaking activity where people could explore making algae string from sodium alginate and calcium chloride. We asked people to share ideas for future uses. One visitor suggested algae string as a replacement for plastic produce bags. We learned that algae string is conductive when wet and not conductive when dry. We conduct this experiment at the event for people to see. How might this be useful as a circuit on-off switch in agricultural sensor device? One visitor suggested bio-based sensor, bio sensors for automated plant watering. When resistance gets too high, watering starts. DIY hygrometer and watering system. We displayed our micro-based self-watering system. This used turbo motor and straw with a DIY nail hygrometer. We use MakeCode to program our micro bits. Another activity we had was a paper microscope. We put a plexiglass sphere and taped it into paper to create a paper microscope. And we observed vibrant flower petals and other plant materials. This is an inexpensive way of showing people science. We share a mycelium container so people could imagine growing a pot or a vase or food packaging in new ways. Two members of our team, Alec and Roberto, created 3D print root biome study tools in Tinker, in tinker Card. These were 3D printed. We created these to raise awareness of the unseen root environment in the soil. These tools can be used to create a controlled environment to grow seeds. What are good local fertilizers we can make using waste from, fishing, from the fishing industry and algae? Our fleet of Baltech by the throw cards will spark, sustain, and deepen interest and ownership of the questions driving ag tech and biotech in our community. Our model of street vending cards is a way to engage other communities also missing from sustainability biodesign conversations. Accessible biodesign education and explorations will greatly impact the future equity and social justice in agricultural worker communities. Let's grow biodesign learning in friendly, trusted spaces and bring more people into the conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Well done, Nest Makerspace. Um, nice to see you all, all here. Um, we'll go right into the questions with the judges. Judges, um, feel free to turn on your video when you're ready. All right, uh, we'll do Anya and then John. Thank you for a lovely presentation, Nest Makerspace. I really love that you got out in the community and we're really thinking thoughtfully about your community. And I'm curious if um, after the 
the in-person testing and prototyping that you did. I'm um, curious if you learned things that actually informed changes to your project design or the design of your cart um, or the activities that you actually imagine putting on this cart. So what we learned from that is like, we saw how the vibrant colors that we put on our cart, it attracted more people. So maybe next time when we prototype it, we can add more colors and maybe like a bigger cart to add more things to do and that'll attract more people. Okay, if you guys don't wanna add, um, go ahead, John, when you're ready. Yeah, well, first I just wanna say, I, I mean, you guys are doing like bona fide outreach work and or engagement work, I should say, not outreach. Um, and it's really impressive. Um, so you should be you should be quite proud. Um, I love the idea and I love the fact that you listened to your community's needs and got their input um, before developing, you know, the types of projects that you'd show in these carts. Um, and that is not a given in engagement work. So so kudos to that. Um, I'm curious more about the the partnerships aspect. Um, you, you mentioned it a bit, but who are the kind of uh, community leaders that you that you've partnered with and you hope to build long term partnerships with uh, to continue this work and, and become more of a, a I guess, a fixture. Uh, so when we when we uh, presented our our cart, we went to a community garden where there were people with the same interests who were uh, working with ag. And um, those are the people that that reached out to us. So we're building relationships with uh, people in our community that are that, are, that have the same interest in bettering our agriculture in our community. Cool. Uh, Naomi, if you'd like to ask. Thank you. Um, I'm really intrigued that, that your project is a lot of things, you know, you, you did a lot of things, but you put the spotlight on the venue making aspect, this, you know, cart, the decorated cart where you, where you can actually do the activity on. Um, why, why was it so important? Uh, is it such a critical thing to bring people together? Like, we are, can you tell us a little bit more about why that aspect of your project become the, took the center stage? Well, me personally, like I love art and it's been like a real passion for me. And I think like that's what gets people around the car, the Bible colors and all that. So, so yeah. And in our community, uh, Palatoro cards are, um, uh, people are attracted to them because they, they usually sell the uh, ice cream. So our, we thought of it as bringing people in to inform them about pro our, yeah, problems and solutions in our, in our community. Were well, they surprised once they come to your, your, your cart? It, it wasn't ice cream, it was a <laughs> science project. Yeah, it, it, yeah. it was really interesting to see how they reacted and they, and how they did the different experiments and they and they liked learning about um, different problems. All right, we'll do one last question from um, Hank. Oh, yeah, I, thought, uh, I thought this was a very cool project. Um, I liked it a lot. Uh, logistical questions. How, how many people did you need to, to be running the cart at any given time? And did you run into trouble with expertise? I could imagine some of the community members asking you questions that might get deeper than you could actually, that, than you knew the answers to. Well, it took, well we had, oh, so awesome. It took, oh, actually four of us, uh, me, Sammy, Alec, and Cammy, oh, five of us, Robert. There was one person that asked us questions and it did, we didn't know the answer to that, but we researched it and Next time we'll answer it better. And we had two, two, uh, two people on the cart at all times, and the other two were trying to track more people to the cart. So it was like two people showing Got different it. experiments of the biotech cart, and then the two others were trying to get people towards the cart. And with uh, different products on the cart, um, when people came up with different questions, we actually worked off those questions. Like we had an algae string, and we were, we were able to rehydrate it and build a circuit right on the cars, which is pretty interesting to see how we were able to work directly on the car. Any last questions? All right, 
Okay. Um, thank you all for for that hard work for for that presentation. Um, we are going to move on to our next team, which is the University of California, Santa Cruz. Hello, my name is Silvana and I am a participant in the Biodesign Challenge 2021. Can virtual world building provide new collaborative possibilities for knowing microorganisms like SCOBY? Using SCOBY, which stands for Symbiotic Culture of Bacteria and Yeast, I created a virtual reality room out of dried scobies and wet scobies. Scobies are a byproduct of kombucha brewing created by yeasts weaving together cellulose. This cellulose can be dried to create a leather-like material. Scanning them over here, I was able to create the whole bubble that this exhibit is hosted inside. In the corner, you will see a speculative design of potential sculpture. Over here, I was brewing kombucha. I should demonstrate how to brew your own kombucha, which is made using sweet tea. All you need is a scoby, sweet tea, and time in order to make your own kombucha at home. I decided to brew kombucha over the pandemic and during my What Makes Us Human project, learned how to create this hub. Hello, my name is Saul, and I'm a participant in the Biodesign Challenge 2021. Can a virtual experiential world produce innovative opportunities to experience the environment through the lens of speculative design. Using the design challenge as an opportunity to create an immersive bio art world as a tool for speculative thinking and design shifts and opens new possibilities for experiencing and learning about art and biology, unbound by the physical non-virtual world. Placing the SCOBY art lab inside the world is just one example of what a bio art world building environment can be as a unique lens to alter and shift how we view the natural world. A new lens, just as a telescope, microscope or camera are lens and tools for knowledge building and speculating, virtual worlds offer a new lens for discovery reimagining the natural world as an archive with an ecocentric view on methods created with interactive taxonomies for both human and non-human participants. Hi everyone, welcome back. Uh, thank you uh, UC Santa Cruz for that video. Um, it looks like Saul, you have a very quick thing to say first before we go into the judges, so go, go for it. 
I just want to say I want to have the pleasure to work with my colleague Silvana Morsianu, who's going to also introduce us and put into the chat the speculative world that you can access um, that will guide you into the SCOBY lab. Amazing. Yeah, that should be in the chat for you judges. Um, let's go right into the questions. Uh, Justin, you're ready to go. So, <laughs> Yeah. Um, great, great concept, guys. And I think it's really nice to see these kinds of projects coming through the challenge as well. Um, I really love the idea of the sense of bio sensing biology virtually, especially in ways that we can't sense it as humans ordinarily. But I also I particularly know things like microbial world and that kind of thing. But um, I'm also, you know, we can't, we've got to be careful of this risk of um, people becoming really complacent or a heightened sense of complacency around preserving nature when they can just experience it virtually. So my question is, have you thought about how to deal with that kind of complacency? And then also you talked about it being a tool for speculating, which I think is really exciting, but you didn't really flesh that out more and tell us some speculating. So yeah, it's kind of a two-part question. Maybe you want, want to only answer one or the other or both together, but Firstly, heightened complacency and how to deal with it and as a tool for speculating. Do you want to go first? Sure. So as a tool for speculating, um, our lab kind of gave us the ability to be able to experiment with materials like the SCOBY, which is a byproduct of kombucha, um, and create this virtual world. Uh, people, I think, um, it's important to be aware that the Anthropocene has had a huge impact on our natural environment and that um, this awareness between uh, the multi-species system that we um, live in, um, it's, it's important for humans to be aware of the fact that we do have a huge impact on the environment, but not to assume that the environment needs to be experienced in one way. So a lot of the thinking behind this hub was because of COVID and the restriction for being able to meet in person. So I had to construct the SCOBY lab in order to show people what I was um, doing in real life and in constructing this virtual world. And through the videos that I made, I was able to capture an environment that I was experiencing and show to people as well. And I think there's a lot of uh, validity um, in and in virtual environments and that the main challenge is having embodied experiences that go beyond just sensor sensing um, with our eyes and our ears so this is why I think this is a main challenge is that the sensory uh, experience of virtual worlds is limited to in comparison to what we can um, experience in real in the real world um, I'd be curious to see how we can bridge that gap. Um, but this project is a step towards that. So. And also to add to that, um, you know, a lot of the library systems um, did shut down and we didn't have a lot of access to um, the materiality of books and different um, objectivities and uh, archives that weren't available to us. So, you know, going out there and recording uh, the environment and, you know, digitizing the environment as an archive to be able to have as um, documentation and have this new respect for like the natural world it kind of helps us reimagine like what it is that we're really trying to save the environment for like what are we trying to respect um, and I think just using uh, you know scientific illustration taxonomies um, ideas on heat mapping techniques infrared photography so you know the the actual uh, way of viewing things and uh, making these type of illustrations i think kind of all put it together where you know we're trying to create this new archive and a different interactive experience so that you know if there are opportunities in the future um, where we are able to experience the environment uh in you know physical you are able to still at least get a form of uh, interaction through all of these different types of way of seeing. So that's kind of the, the idea of the speculative and why we um, were very important um, 
I guess, trying to highlight the research that's happening at our university right now, too. A lot of the uh, projects that are highlighted inside the hub connect to um, a very important uh, topic that's researched where uh, marine fog that was, uh, you know, it's an invisible uh, toxic mercury that lingers on the coastal fog that just has this cycle that um, ruins a lot of those um, symbiotic relationships with different animals and i think that in research being able to be viewed in a different light inside the hub also circles it back into a way that it's bringing issues um back where we can highlight and research um in different forms wonderful do we have any other questions from the judges doug please Hi, yes, uh, I was really uh, very excited to see this project. It, it, I feel like it gave me a lot to think about. And <clears throat> uh, I can see how uh, living through a year plus of COVID may have informed some of your thinking about this or looking to uh, other ways to, to share these kinds of ideas or to explore things which uh, may not be as accessible as they normally might be. I wonder, did you think about uh, using uh, you know, tools like this or you know, putting your uh, some of your uh, technology into a format that could be used to actually go and explore and, and experience the same kind of invisible things and, and uh, see them in that way and get them out of the computer. A lot of the archives, um, the photos that are um, displayed inside the hub are actually printed out. So there's like another archive that's presented. Uh, for example, we did the um, Natural History Museum, we printed out a lot of the specimens, um, photography, uh, photo stills. So there was like this play where um, we were trying to figure out the objectivity of like the printing of what we were taking photos of and also taking uh, video. So like the moving image was very important to try to project um, not just the still image, but something that gives you more of an interaction. And all of the information and the videos and images, especially the SCOBY uh, that was grown from the lab that uh, Silvana made um, was uh, created. Uh, so there was an interaction that we uh, produced that we just then archived. I think Doug, you bring up a good uh, point in, um, in your question about using augmented reality um, as a way to explore uh, an environment even more so um, in Scoby Lab. What's very cool is that you're actually, if you um, are watching this on your phone, this uh, Zoom, um, you can open Mozilla, the, you can open the lab itself um, in a mobile phone and navigate it, but that's only stationary. You, we don't have the ability yet to um, use the camera to explore the environment, but that is a very, um, cool consideration and uh, I'd, I'd be interested in seeing how I could potentially point a camera at my SCOBYs and make them uh, exist in the virtual world really quickly. All right, thank you. thank you team. Thank you judges for the questions. We're gonna move on to the next video, wonderful job. Um, up next we have University of California, Davis. totaling more than 1.1 million acres in California, Montana, Oregon, Australia, Brazil. With climate change, the atmosphere is hotter and drier. Rating poor air quality across the region. To combat ongoing mask shortages, his hospital and others across the country, they're reusing N95 masks. Another side effect of the coronavirus, pollution. It's, it's everywhere. It's Bali, it's Guatemala, it's Haiti. Masks are required all around the world and they're tossing them into these parking lots. And all these drains are leading to the oceans. In the face of global climate change, the need for masks has been magnified in the past decade to protect users from a variety of airborne particles, including viruses, wildfire smoke, occupational hazards, and city pollution. However, most, if not all, current mask designs involve trade-offs between efficacy and environmental impact. Cloth masks rely on cotton, requiring large amounts of water to produce. They are also not effective in filtration due to their large pore size and non-charged fibers. N95 masks are far more effective filtering 95% of airborne particulates, 
The N95 is used in the US and some of its foreign equivalents are the Chinese KN95 and the European FFP2. They are essential for a variety of professions such as nurses, firefighters, and construction contractors, but they are made of non-biodegradable materials, mostly polypropylene fibers. Overall, current mask designs are either unsustainable or contribute to the buildup of microplastic pollution in the environment. Therefore, we aim to create a mask that can be sustainably produced with minimal environmental impact, but is still able to filter 95% of particulates as the N95 does. After extensive prototyping and research with a variety of biological materials, including bacterial cellulose, mycelium, gelatin biofoam, and agar bioplastics, we developed materials that we believe can mimic the N95. The Green 95 is made of four materials, agar bioplastics, cellulose nonwovens, biofoam, and an electrospun polyvinyl alcohol composite with either chitosan or plant protein. N95s filter with charge layers that attract and capture airborne particulates. Through a process called electrospinning, nonwoven, thin, and electrically charged polypropylene fibers are produced that create the layers. Essentially, electrospun fibers are created with high voltage and a feeding nozzle, through which a polymer solution turns into a droplet and from that droplet, charged nanofibers can form and be collected. Several biological polymers can be used to create an electrospun non-woven for air filtration. These include bioplastics, chitosan PVA composites, or plant protein composites. Experimentation is required to determine which combination would be the most effective for our mask. The innermost layer is the bioplastic non-woven, primarily made of agar water and glycerol. Next is the chitosan PVA layer, which would help prevent preemptive breakdown of the mask, or the plant protein layer, which has been shown to filter extremely small molecules like carbon monoxide. Then comes the cellulose layer, which is made of agricultural waste and gives the mask structure. We created a gelatin biofoam ring around the perimeter of the mask to enhance the seal and comfort of the face wear. Additionally, we used stretchy bioplastic for straps and created a moldable bioplastic strip that can be wet down and reshaped to custom fit the user's nose. Our mask emphasizes sustainability and comfort, challenging the perception that masks are inconvenient single-use items. At this point, you may be wondering, what are the environmental implications of Green 95? Well, first, all of the components of the mask are biodegradable, as they are all essentially sourced from living organisms. Production of our mask will also take advantage of agricultural waste byproducts and encourage sustainable farming practices, such as algae farming, for sourcing our agar bioplastic material. We will then create a system for deconstructing masks at the end of their life cycle and recycle them into new units. Formation of the cellulose paper layer in particular requires large volumes of water to process. However, compared to cotton masks, this layer alone can reduce water use by a factor of 1 in 3,000. At scale, we would also investigate the possibility of using reclaimed or gray water to manufacture this part or recycle water within the facility. Lastly, the mask does not involve harsh chemicals during production. Overall, all of our materials are fully renewable and do not involve petroleum products, allowing for a more sustainable life cycle. Now we will compare the life cycles of N95s and the Green 95. First, let's take a closer look at the life cycle of a traditional N95 mask. From first glance, the life cycle is relatively linear, with minimal possibilities of reuse. Requiring unsustainable petroleum and high-input agriculture, production starts with cotton and non-biodegradable synthetic fibers, such as polypropylene and polyester. Ultimately, the process ends with disposal of N95s in landfills, evidently showing that the development of N95 masks demonstrates very little consideration for the environment. In comparison, we have the Green 95. The life cycle of Green 95 is circular, beginning with waste products and ending with reuse, recycling, and reintegration into the environment. The source for the chitosan starts with shellfish waste, and with 6 to 8 million tons discarded globally every year, there will be enough chitosan supply for large-scale production of this mask layer. Next, the cellulose layer relies on the estimated 3 billion tons of crop residue produced around the world, but further experimentation will investigate the use of cellulose-rich plant waste for a more efficient yield. Last but not least, we have glycerol and gelatin that is inputted into the production of the biofoam and bioplastic parts of the mask. 
However, instead of gelatin, we hope to produce similar results with a more sustainable material, agar, through further experimentation. All of this eventually brings us to the final product, the Green 95. However, instead of being disposed of after a few cycles of reuse, the cycle continues with further recycling and natural reintegration into the environment through decomposition. Reviewing the life cycles of both masks, it is safe to conclude that the Green 95 is much more eco-friendly than its unsustainable counterpart, the N95s. Our project aims to improve the health and welfare of the general populace exposed to airborne toxins, with particular emphasis on people in urban or manufacturing centers. Since we are revising the N95 mask, our initial design would be geared towards North American users, with the goal of expanding into other regions covered by alternate masks like the KN95 and the FF2P. We also want our mask to be more widely available to the public than the N95. To make this project a reality, we'd want to form partnerships with companies who currently produce N95 masks, as much of our design could in theory be integrated into existing infrastructure because it is made using the same machinery but with different materials. We'd want our project to demonstrate to consumers that biotechnology can be a viable, sustainable, and more equitable way forward for society at large. Despite recent increases in mask wearing practices, there are still many barriers to adoption of our product. As the pandemic continues, people have become more reluctant, even resistant, to wear common masks, even in the face of overwhelming evidence that points to their efficacy. These groups will likely persist in some form after the pandemic, and will likely resist wearing protective masks for airborne pollution too. Our mask would first and foremost be for those who are concerned about their own health and for the health of others, which is fortunately the majority of the population. However, as we expand to different regions, there may be different or fewer barriers to adoption. For example, in East Asian countries, mask wearing is already a seasonal and common practice, so we would expect the Green 95 to be more easily adopted in this region. Our ability to prototype this quarter was limited mostly to kitchen sink science, and we recognize that as a result, there are certain gaps in our knowledge and areas that need to be filled in with empirical testing. However, we are semi-finalists in the National Barta Mask Innovation Challenge and look forward to developing a functional prototype this summer with funding from the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, if we are selected as finalists. In the not-so-distant future, we plan to look more into more sophisticated iterations of our materials. In particular, we were looking into using genetically engineered Wolfia arise as a sustainable source of spinnable plant protein and examining the possibility of integrating cellulose nanofibers into our non-wovens. In terms of more speculative ideas that are farther in the future, we plan on developing a method of recharging and or sanitizing our masks, specifically in the form of a charging station. We imagine these charging stations being placed around urban centers, allowing people to easily recharge their masks and extend the lifetime of the product. While the coronavirus pandemic is subsiding in the U.S., masks will continue to be necessary to protect citizens from air pollution, wildfire smoke, and future pandemics. The Green 95 is the perfect solution because it will be effective, comfortable, and sustainable in the long term. Special thanks to all our professors. We couldn't have done it all without you. All right, and we are back. So uh, thank you, UC Davis, for that presentation. We're going to go right into the questions with the judges when you're ready, judges. Here we go, Naomi. Make sure you unmute yourself first. Naomi, uh, you're muted still. We can't hear you. Sorry about that. Um, yes. Uh, thank you very much for that, that project. Um, very timely and important. Um, I'm just wondering that, that you know, it, amazing material exploration you guys did. Um, you say kitchen science. Uh, uh, yeah, it's it's quite impressive. But I'm wondering, did you need all the four different kinds of material? Did you kind of try to minimize it? Because, uh, you know, mixture of a material is is uh, sometimes not good for, you know, recycling or, or like even, even for biodegradation, it can get complicated. Uh, is it the minimal design? Or is it something that four cool materials you you developed and then why don't we use all of them? <laughs> yeah, can you kind of tell us a little bit more about the design decision? Yeah, that is an excellent question. So to start with, 
The mask in its current form, we've identified a lot of different materials that we think would be useful for it, and we want to kind of pare it down a little bit through experimentation. So seeing like if we could do maybe only three layers of specific types or two layers of a certain material that might work better. We want to see with and collect some actual data on what the most effective way would be to, to do it. So it's the kind of the, the broad look right now, all of our possibilities. Great, Hank, go ahead. Uh, so a cool project. Um, first, did you actually make any masks? Um, and second, uh, sort of building on Naomi's question, I was wondering about, as a practical matter, the accessibility of the, the chitosan and the crop waste and being able to use those. And I'll sneak a third one in if I can, and that is recycling. Uh, the recycling sounds nice, but but it's getting it from the consumer to some sort of recycling thing. You're going to have a separate recycling bin at the sidewalk for uh, N95 masks. So kind of nitty gritty questions. Hi, I can take this one. So we did make a couple of iterations of our mask. Neither of them were functional because we didn't have access to the proper electro spinning equipment. But um, as you can see in the video, we had a little wearable prototype um, and we did experiment with some of the actual materials that we'll be using, such as the bioplastics. They just aren't in the non-woven form. And so we got to do a lot of experimenting with those. And in terms of recycling, we Yes, um, like you suggested, we were um, thinking about including a little bin probably connected to the recharging station, but we really want to emphasize utilizing the recharging station because that will help us save lots of energy um, that could be used like through transportation to recycling systems. But instead, um, by having those located in different cities, we could save that energy. Hope that answered your questions. Thanks. Uh, we have time for one last question, if any of the judges have one. Yes, Anya, please. A wonderful project. Uh, I, loved, I loved all of the details that you were able to, to provide, especially about your visions of, of the life cycle, which is really great. Um, I actually had a question about wearability and fit and comfort. Um, and I'm, I'm wondering if as part of your process, you were able to talk to anybody, any potential users about your product, um, and did that inform your considering uh, many of us have been wearing masks over the last year. And how did that inform your design? I can touch on this briefly. So we, we mentioned in our presentation that we talked about the wearability of the mask, but perhaps we didn't uh, emphasize it enough. So there are a couple different aspects that will help the wearability of the mask. In particular, the nose clamp made of bioplastic that will be adjustable to people with different size of noses. We also have the biofilm that will help form a seal regardless of the size of the person's face of the mask. And we didn't, we talked to a few people who had experience with N95s, a couple of material scientists, and they emphasized that fit was very important. Wonderful. Um, great job, team. I'm ex I like to see the speculation, too. Uh, it was cool to see the charging stations and what you'll do next. So uh, great job. Um, we're going to take a 15 minute break now before we come back for our last session of the day. So during this 15 minute break, we'll be playing a bunch of uh, videos from our alumni over the years from some of our community members who are artists and designers and scientists, our sponsors, et cetera, et cetera. So we hope you stick around and take a look at those and we will see you all in 15 minutes. Take care. Hey there. I know I haven't used you in a while, but it's just because, you know, our values don't really align anymore. See, I just found out the damaging effects that you and I are both having on the environment. Every time I wash my synthetic polyester clothing with you, we release hundreds of thousands of microplastics into our waterways. Studies have shown that up to 700,000 microplastic fibres are released in an average wash. These microfibres make their way from my drains to new waterways and eventually to the ocean. 
This is affecting not only my health, marine health, but also my family's health. I don't think you understand. This means that I'm eating microplastics, drinking microplastics, I'm even breathing microplastics. And it's only going to get worse. It's estimated that by 2030, polyester clothing is going to increase by 92%. You know what? This means that you are a major source of microplastics. Well, I guess we, we both are. Look, the real reason I'm telling you this is because I found a solution. It's called the Enza Biofilter. I've done some research on their website and this one biofilter, well, what it does is it collects microplastics, degrades microplastics, and I can install it at home by myself. So I went ahead and ordered one of the filters and it arrived this morning. Hey Matt, can you bring in that biofilter I bought? Thank you. I reckon it looks pretty good. Let's install it now. How's that? I've just installed it and it fit really well. I'm glad we're able to talk about this. I just want our washing experience to be easy and not harm the environment anymore. That's why I chose Enza. So I chose Enza. So I chose Enza. I chose Enza. So I chose Enza. This is more than a lab or an office or a meeting place. The Science Center is a network of innovators who are making things happen. We're experts testing theories, students finding our passions, artists bringing ideas to life. We're entrepreneurs turning ideas into businesses, fueling billions into the economy and solving problems that the entire world needs solved. We're united by a common drive, a hunger for change and a curiosity to push beyond the status quo. We're taking on challenges and sometimes we fail in the process, but for us, not trying is not an option. We experiment, fail, repeat, experiment, fail, repeat, and then one day we hit a breakthrough that changes everything. Medications that save lives, art that ignites conversations, wearable devices that protect their user, cancer treatments, even a better way to brew beer. This is what's happening here by people who wake up every day willing to try. United by a thirst for discovery, we are all scientists, whether we realize it or not. And together, we're taking ideas to IPO and beyond. I've been dancing since I was about four years old. Dance gave me a sense of confidence and this belief that I could do anything. My passion for math began in elementary school. But when I was a teacher, I saw how girls of color just don't think that math is for them. I want to shatter those barriers, and I think that dance can be that tool that can unlock that in them. At STEM From Dance, we believe that Girls of color can be our next generation of engineers, scientists, technologists, and dance breeds the confidence that we need our girls to have in STEM. During the summer program, girls create dance performances that incorporate both dance and tech that they showcase at the end of the program. That can be a projection that is displayed behind them while they're performing. Our girls learn how to come up with an idea and bring it to life. Just like dancing, learning STEM concepts doesn't always come natural. There's parts of it that's confusing where they may not know which direction to go in or the circuit that they created doesn't work. Hmm. Confused. You don't know why it's not working. Are these tightened? Okay, wait. I got it. Now go to the other one, go to the other one. The level up is on the other one. But it's when they overcome that hump and, and just push through, they become so proud of what they create. We want this sense of we're in this together and we're gonna create something awesome. Seeing girls who come to us shy, intimidated by science, 
transform during our program isn't surprising to me. I've always seen their potential, but when they see it themselves, that's powerful. Hi, I'm Dan. I'm Vina. I'm Alex. And I'm Emma, and we're the team behind Biodesign Challenge. We want your help to publish our first ever book, Biodesign Challenge, a retrospective. BDC is an international education program and competition that's shaping the first generation of biodesigners. We pair high school and university students with artists, designers, and scientists to envision, create, and critique transformational applications in biotechnology. Our projects have gone on to show in museums and galleries around the world, and many have served as inspiration for new companies. The book will be a full color celebration of work produced by the BDC community over the last five years. It will feature 28 projects that bridge art, design, and biotechnology. Not only will it include essays by our alumni, but perspectives from eminent practitioners in the field. Newcomers will find a primer on biodesign and how it's shaping the future of sustainability. For those already familiar, the book will offer insights from thought leaders, including biologist Paul Fremont, curator William Myers, and many others. It'll also include a foreword by Paula Antonelli, senior curator of architecture and design at MoMA. BDC has collaborated with organizations including Science Sandbox, the National Endowment for the Arts, the Parsons School of Design, and the Museum of Modern Art, where we hold our annual summit. We are publishing the book in partnership with the University Science Center in Philadelphia. So, if you're interested in learning more about innovative and fascinating topics, or if you just want to be awesome and support the next generation of bio designers, then this book is for you. Every pledge, no matter how big or small, helps bring us closer to our goal. Thank you for your support. We can't wait to share the retrospective with you.
happy birthday, BDC. Today, I'm going to teach you guys how to make a fun, color-changing cocktail at home. In order to do this, all you need is a glass, some sugar, tequila or alcohol of your preference, some limes or lime juice, if you feel and you have them, cherries and cherry liquid, a way to boil water, a red cabbage, some baking soda, and finally, a little bit of salt. Next, you're just going to cut a little bit of your cabbage, just so that you have enough for uh, a quarter or a half a cup. Chop that mama up and place it in your bowl. Now take that boiling water and cover the cabbage and just by a couple inches and let that sit for five to 10 minutes. We're also gonna make the simple syrup that we need. So this requires a one-to-one -one ratio of sugar and water. And eyeballing that. And we're just gonna mix that up. Now we're just gonna cut up our lime. Next, we're going to salt the rim of the glass. This is the most fun part. So we're just going to take a plate that you've covered with a little bit of salt. And you're just gonna use one of your slices and run it along the rim of your glass, just so that it gets nice and juicy. Take your salt, shake it up a little bit, and you're just going to make sure to coat the outside. Beautiful. Just going to drain our cabbage liquid out. The longer you let it uh, soak, the darker it'll become. But I like this color, so I'm happy with it. We're going to use our beautiful cabbage juice. So you can eyeball this. I'm going to put about tablespoons <laughs> into the container. We're just going to take about a quarter te teaspoon of baking soda and plop it in. We'll mix that up. And now, our liquids become blue. Next, we're going to add our tequila, simple syrup, and lime juice. So you can add about one or two shots if you would like. So that's about one ounce of tequila, about half an ounce of simple syrup, and some fresh lime juice, and pre-prepared lime juice. We'll just shake that up. Give it a good little shake. All done. Next, I'm just gonna add another ice cube to our concoction and watch it change color. Garnish it with a little lime. Cheers! We got your cherry, add a little juice, and a little love, now you're done. So that's the famous BDC Fiving and Thriving Color Changing Cocktail. Hope everyone's staying safe and sane. Cheers! Hmm. Phenomenal.
Hi, everyone. We are back. I hope you enjoyed the uh, short commercials that we just had. Um, we're going to go right into our next uh, session. So we will kick it off with the University of Cincinnati. Most people agree that climate change is a significant issue. Every year, we see reports in the news how it's only a matter of time before the damage we've done to our Earth is irreversible. In our everyday lives, it's easy to think that we can't change the course of global warming. Oftentimes, people point to large corporations and governments as the cause for most greenhouse gas emissions. While this is true, our individual actions are capable of inciting large social shifts towards sustainability. It's our job to pressure our legislators and be the change we want to see in our world. I am Cyprusad Naidu, a student at the University of Cincinnati and fellow biodesigner. I'm here to present to you my hope to have a positive impact on our globe. It's not often we think about where our food comes from and how it's made, but every year the agricultural industry produces 670 million metric tons of greenhouse gases. The average meal of an American has to travel almost 1,500 miles before reaching the table. 30 to 40 percent of our food supply is wasted each year in the U.S. The average family throws away 250 pounds of food a year. That is enough to feed an entire pride of lions. Food waste is the largest category of waste dumped into municipal landfills. And considering that almost 1 billion people suffer from some level of food shortages, I feel terrible knowing that we waste this much food. Postmix was born out of the need for sustainable agriculture and food waste reduction. Our product is a modern take on an old concept. Composting has been around for millennia, beginning with the very first agricultural civilizations. The idea is simple enough. Take a bunch of organic matter and small microbes and allow the microbes to decompose the organic matter for a while. Then add this mixture, or compost, to your soil and watch your plants flourish. A common misconception about compost is that compost is the same as fertilizer. A better way to think about this, however, is that compost feeds the soil, where fertilizer feeds the plants. In practice, compost is slightly more complex because not every organic material is compostable. Additionally, there is a very specific balance of carbon sources, nitrogen sources, and water, along with appropriate aeration and heat to create compost. Our device does all of this without the need to constantly monitor your compost. With their novel sensory technology, you no longer have to question if what you have is compostable or not because our device will let you know with our immediate feedback system. Our sensors are based on chemical light and 3D scanning technology to determine if something is compostable. They leverage similar technology to what astronomers use to identify the chemical composition of planets outside of our solar system. Much of this technology exists for various scientific and industrial purposes, however we had very specific design constraints that required the use of novel techniques. Our sensors had to be small enough to fit inside of our composting bin while remaining sensitive to a wide variety of materials and remaining energy efficient. Our device is also able to regulate temperature, moisture, and aeration levels, and is also solar powered and manufactured by green standards in order to limit our carbon footprint. Composting can drop household food waste by nearly 30 to 40 percent. But how does all this limit greenhouse gas emission? Landfills are dark and low in oxygen, so organic waste does not decompose efficiently in them. Instead, its degradation produces toxic gases like methane, which can be 50 times more potent than CO2. In fact, Landfills are America's third largest source of methane emissions, emitting over 100 million metric tons of carbon dioxide equivalent a year. Composting organic material could significantly reduce these numbers. Additionally, the best way to reduce the need for big farms and food transportation is to locally grow and source food. A lot of middle class Americans have small gardens in their backyards. Some neighborhoods and cities even have community gardens. However, there are a lot of barriers to start in a garden or community garden for people who live in neighborhoods with low incomes. Postmix can help lower the annual cost of maintaining a garden by increasing the yield of your garden and also protecting the soil from degradation. To help afford our device, we have compiled a list of grants that individual and communities can apply for to help pay for the cost of our device. These can be found on our website. By increasing the number of home and community gardens, we can lower the need for big farms and large-scale food transportation. By committing to local growing, 
we can start the journey towards sustainable agriculture. Although it is unlikely that we will see global greenhouse emissions decrease drastically because of local farms, we can place economic pressures on the agricultural industry so they will be forced to adopt more environmentally friendly practices. It will take the combined efforts of everyone to reverse the damages we've done to our earth, but postmix is a great first step that anyone can begin their journey to sustainability. All right, there we go. Thank you, Sai. Um, we're going to open it up to the judges for questions whenever you all are ready. Everyone's speechless. All right, Naomi, here we go. <laughs> Good. I'll just start. <laughs> the, um, uh, yeah, so thank you very much. Um, yeah, um, composting at home. Um, and uh, I, I'm really intrigued by you, the feature uh, of your you know, uh, uh, the device that you can have, you propose to have the sensor that, you know, that let, determines if uh, something you're putting in there is compostable or even like a ratio of, uh, you know, what you are comp you're trying to compost. Um, how does that work? Can you elaborate? Can you tell us a little bit more? Yeah, thank you so much for your question. So, to be completely upfront, the technology is speculative. Um, I don't know. I think I mentioned that in the video, but I just want to emphasize again that it's not like I developed the sensory technology, but I base this idea on technology that I saw already kind of exists uh, in various fields. So, like I mentioned, um, like spectroscopy is something that is done in like even Gen Chem labs at the college level. And that's able to, uh, to detect you know, the chemical composition of certain materials. Uh, I wanted to combine this idea as well as some basic like 3D scanning technology in order to uh, then kind of check uh, every compost, every item that you would like you know, put in front of my device uh, against a, a database of source so that you know, the um, computer or the, you know, the computer or so on hand is then able to give you feedback and say, you know, green light, yes, this is compostable, red light, no, please don't compost this. Justin, go ahead, please. Sorry. Yeah, um, I think that there, and lots of times I've wondered whether something is or isn't compostable or recyclable, so I think there is something really interesting about that, but I, I think it would be great to hear more about the way you envision the life cycle and and day-to-day -day use of this product, because what if you know, every, like 80% of the things I, I scan say you can't compost it. Like, what do I then do? Or do I just become like, oh, well, that's not my problem. Yeah. So how do you envision the kind of life cycle of this um, product? Yeah. So I guess that depends on the use. Uh, I guess like the, the individual uh, who is like owning the device. So whether it's like a restaurant or, you know, located at a more public setting or if it's in like a family uh, kind of setting. So that'll depend, that'll kind of change the amount of waste that's inputted and the amount of compostable waste. But um, like I mentioned in the video, roughly 30 to 40% of just like a family uh, waste includes compostable materials. So I was hoping that just throughout the course of a week, uh, if this device is in, you know, someone's house, uh, like a, on average, you would be able to fill up the device in one to two weeks. And then from there, the compost would be ready in another one to two weeks. And this would um, essentially kind of serve as like the standard lifestyle. So again, this would kind of differ if you're uh, maybe say a restaurant, in which case um, you'd probably fill that up a lot faster just through you know day-to-day -day customers. And then if it's located at like a church or a park, uh, that'll vary depending on the season. So at like a park, you know, during the winter, it may not get as much use. During the summer, it would get a lot more use. Um, so I guess the, the, the benefit of, of having a device like this is that it's flexible. So because it's kind of self-regulating and you don't have to constantly check on it, um, you can kind of just leave the device there um, and check it, you know, only periodically every two to four weeks or depending on how much time it, you expect for the device to fill up. You know, you check periodically just to remove the compost and then um, uh, get ready again for the, the next cycle of use.
We have time for one more question. Yes, Anne, please. Anne, you're muted. So I also compost and uh, live in an urban area. So the idea that you could do this, you're contributing back to a greener environment is fantastic. But I'm also curious about some of the scalability that you kind of bring to the table. Like if you start to bring this to a restaurant scale, have you thought of the sort of downstream uses of, you know, what do you do with the compost that is actually produced? Um, because restaurants may not have gardens or access to community gardens. So how does that more circular pathway for this technology for an ancient process, how does that scale up to really be a good solution? Yeah, so this is a really great question and something that I've been thinking about since, you know, I started Postmix. And the, the basic solution is that uh, the goal is to create kind of partnerships between, you know, location, whether it's a restaurant park or even kind of a, a conglomerate of, you know, locations, uh, create a partnership between them and then either a community garden or um, even our own company itself. Maybe we can help to distribute that compost to people in need, kind of like how I mentioned some of those uh, like socioeconomic barriers to gardening. I think the the hope is to create a system so that all the excess compost that's created, if it's not directly used by the owner of the device, can then be donated and kind of put back to good use um, through hopefully like a network of like users or, you know, people in need of, of compost. Great, thanks. Awesome. Okay, looks like you have next steps, I. Nice. Um, we're going to move on to the next team now. Uh, thank you again, Cincinnati. Uh, our next team is Ball State University. Invasive species are at our doors, barging in unannounced, causing nearly irreversible damage. Now it's our job to get rid of them, and we start with these. Carp, the bottom feeders. There are three main species. Big head carp, silver carp, and black carp. They eat 120% of their weight in zooplankton and phytoplankton, a crucial food source of our walleye, bluegill, and smallmouth bass. Therefore, we need to eradicate these species of carp from our waters. Complete annihilation is necessary. These carp fight hard battles. We've already tried multiple ways of eradicating them. Now we are developing a new approach. Using the latest advancements in technology, we have designed a bioweapon to fight against the carp. After years of iteration, we are finally ready to release it to the public. There is a looming threat to America and the Midwest. 139 invasive species currently inhabit the waterways of Indiana alone, causing a variety of negative ecological impacts. River Defenders arms fish that are native to the White River, such as walleye. With our help, they may have a fighting chance. Combining human advancements in weapons technology and the natural capabilities of aquatic life, this idea proposes that a military-grade tactical vest be attached to native fish. The vest is equipped with two items, a waterproof camera that provides a live feed to the River Defenders operator and a remote-controlled firearm. This firearm follows in the steps of the Heckler & Koch P11, both in its construction and history. The P11 was one of the many products of weapons development during the Cold War and served as a direct competitor to the Soviet Union's SPP-1, which had been produced five years prior in 1971. At the time, frogmen could only engage in hand-to-hand -hand combat with knives. The development of weapons like these expanded the possibilities of underwater combat. The P-11 was designed with the knowledge that traditional bullets don't travel well through water. It features five barrels that hold flechettes, or metal darts that allow for better accuracy and range. When fired, the P-11 is electrically ignited from a battery pack within the gun. River Defenders builds upon this design with increased ammunition capacity and remote operation via Bluetooth technology. With an official state-of-the-art app, any Muncie resident can connect their smartphone to a River Defender within a range of 800 feet. Once connected, the user can obtain a fish-eyes view of the White River from the camera attached to each fish. Using the invasive species identification software, the user can fire the weapon when a carp appears, taking an active role in combating ecological imbalance. 
As bizarre as this idea may seem, the U.S. military is no stranger to creating alliances with wildlife. For example, in World War II, engineers considered using bat bombs as a weapon against Japan. Once napalm was attached to Mexican free-tailed bats, they would be released to roost in buildings and hard-to-reach places. Another example is Project Pigeon, which utilized the cognitive abilities of pigeons to guide missiles. The pigeons were trained to recognize certain targets and then placed in front of a screen with sensors. The birds would peck at the screen when the target moved away from the center of it, maintaining the bomb's glide path. River Defenders is a testament to the new bonds we may forge with our natural environment in order to protect our traditions and values. In today's society, there is a disconnect between parents and their children due to the fact that most parents were raised without technology. Their children, however, are raised in the digital age and spend increasing amounts of time indoors on phones or tablets. River Defenders bridges this gap between parents and children, creating a new family bonding activity that both generations can enjoy. Over the past two decades, the cleanliness of the White River has also become a major cause for concern. As the river gradually becomes more saturated with heavy metals, PCBs, and other pollutants, recreational activities are becoming unsafe. In fact, river defenders may replace the traditional American pastime of fishing trips. Gone are the days of old school fishing. Now, with river defenders, a new exciting pastime exists. The future is now. The river defenders must work together in order to form a more perfect union to ensure the peace of the White River. It is your time to take action. The River Defenders has a practical function to engage and mobilize the Muncie populace in protecting the ecology of the White River. It is also a band-aid solution that turns human conquest of the natural world into a violent, interactive spectacle. As an example of both biodesign and critical design, River Defenders tackles both environmental and social issues at once. Rooted in the Italian radical design movement of the 60s and 70s, critical design challenges an audience's preconceptions. It's meant to provoke new ways of thinking. Anthony Dunn and Fiona Ravi define critical design goals as raising awareness, exposing assumptions, provoking action, sparking debate, and even entertaining. Oftentimes, these projects explore speculative futures ranging from dystopian to utopian. River Defenders aims to do just that, using the topic of invasive species as a point of departure. Stuart Hall, the cultural theorist, once said, there is no understanding Englishness without understanding its imperial and colonial dimensions. The United States has used this idea for centuries to villainize the other. Under the guise of protection, the U.S. then resorts back to its usual methods of complete eradication and declarations of war. Time after time again, these methods prove wasteful and unsuccessful. Using these ideas in the previous video conveys how the saturation of xenophobia further warps any chance we have of enacting reasoned and positive change. If we continue to view every problem through these lenses of fear and hate, our needed solutions will be unreachable. River Defenders was created to highlight issues with the war on invasives. In the field of ecology, some experts are beginning to take issue with rhetoric surrounding invasive species. The militaristic idea of complete eradication ignores positive qualities that non-native species might bring to an ecosystem. One study showed that, quote, invasive species research uses significantly more militaristic language, end quote, than other subfields of conservation. The power of messaging like this shouldn't be understated. In the short term, rallying communities to declare war on certain species could be helpful. However, it may do more harm than good in the long term distorting the public's understanding of ecology and reinforcing xenophobic tendencies. This conversation gets more complex as we realize that many of our beloved commonplace species were once considered alien or non-native. While not deemed invasive, the honeybee was imported to North America from Europe in the 17th century. We now depend on this poster child of conservation for billions of dollars worth of crops. However, it could be deemed invasive as soon as it begins outcompeting species of wild native bees. Examples like these show the blurry line between helpful and harmful. We then must add climate change into the equation. Climate change is rapidly redefining relationships between all organisms. Consider the tamarisk shrub, for example. Though it has outcompeted many native trees and uses large amounts of water, 
It has begun to provide habitats for endangered species like the southwestern willow flycatcher. It is also hardy and drought tolerant, addressing a problem that we will face in the near future. Invasives like these can withstand shifting temperatures and low resources, and may be the only way our ecosystems can survive. Some scientists even predict they could help us preserve a working ecology. The damage caused by invasive species like cane toads and big head carp is irrefutable, and river defenders doesn't aim to understate it. However, if we refuse to explore new roles they might play in this ever-changing environment, we will keep falling back into costly, unsuccessful methods time after time again. Let's work to build new solutions that look toward the future. All right, thank you, Ball State. Wonderful video. We'll jump right into it. Justin is ready. Guys, just well done. That was so clever, so funny, so bizarre, but also so triggering and real. I just think you've done such a good job of something truly critical and speculative. Um, it also reminded me of a little bit of Sasha Barry Cohen's um, We Are America, or This Is America, Who Is America? I wondered, uh, my question is um, about the responses you've had. So I'm interested to know about responses you've had that have maybe not been what you've expected, people not getting it. So basically not the not the responses that um, are positive and get your work, but the, the other kinds of responses you've had. Uh, so when it comes to uh, our responses, the majority of them have been positive. Um, I'd say the biggest uh, negative that we had was uh, before we finalized the ending portion, uh, we were showing people and they didn't quite understand it. Um, so we had to go back and rewrite and re-video some, some of that ending portion and re-explain it. Um, and with the help of our professor who covered some certain specific things that we needed to touch on, uh, we ended up re-going over it. And then I, I feel like it came together a lot better. After that, we haven't really had too many negative um, opinions on it. Yeah, I can believe that. I think it is, um, and it really shows. I really noticed that the the way it's been put together and curated. I think it was so clever to put all the expl explanatory stuff at the end and not at the beginning, um, and it was just really coherent and clear. So it's obvious that you've done that in numerous iterations. Well done. Thank you. Cool. All right, um, Doug, please. Uh, hi, thank you for this project. I have to admit that uh, my 11 year old daughter really enjoyed it a lot and has been uh, thinking about outfitting our cats with uh, River Defender uh, prototypes. So if you have any ideas about how to do that, I would, I would appreciate that. Um, I, I do uh, in that vein, even though it's kind of tongue in cheek, I'd like to know like what your next uh, intervention would be. Like, would, would you actually want to build one of these River Defenders and show it in use to people at the mall say? Um, I think the goal of the project was kind of to imagine the sort of dystopian future where there's this kind of, uh, where we kind of abandon nuance and just sort of uh, use a sort of militaristic approach to um, ecology in a sense. Uh, so, I mean, there are a huge range of things that uh, people are trying to reduce the uh, spread of invasive species, whether it's like, uh, in terms of carp, people are trying to electrify rivers to almost shock them away. Um, there are like uh, campaigns to send citizens out to, uh, you know, catch certain fish and then turn them into uh, a meal that they wouldn't have normally normally eaten. Um, so I don't think our final product would probably be something that should be marketed. <laughs> Uh, responsibly. Um, but instead, I think it's more of like a, almost like a PSA to encourage people to uh, think about the nuances of uh, invasive versus native, non-native species and uh, the complexities of those debates as climate change affects everything. Thank you for your question. All right, let's go with Annie and we'll end with, or can, running low on time. 
Uh, thank you for the project. I wanted to echo what has been said already. I really enjoyed it. Um, I think my question is, you know, I, I love that it's a critical design project. There was, I think, the, a part A and a part B, the part A being the critical design project and then the part B being your peeling back behind the curtains and explaining it. Um, and I think a lot of speculative design only exists as part A, if that makes sense. You know, I can imagine it going viral <laughs> and it being picked up by Fox News or something like that. And I was wondering how you could imagine the part A encompassing more of part B, if that makes sense, so that it actually gives that critical edge and um, built into it so that it's not so much like you have to peel back the curtain and explain it at the end. This, I think this was a problem we kind of encountered mid project, uh, admittedly, um, where it, we had to kind of, we couldn't redo the entire project, but we had the basis for it. And because uh, some of the details were kind of getting lost, we had to uh, sort of, you know, over explain some parts near the end. I think part of the reason is that it's somewhat of a niche subject, like the inner workings of uh, invasive species management isn't like a very broadly discussed topic a lot of the time. Um, I, I totally understand what you're saying because I feel the same about a lot of speculative projects and they don't have the same kind of oomph to them uh, that I would kind of uh, like, but uh, yeah, I hope that, Someone I know, asked. thanks. Yeah, I still really appreciate the project. Thanks. Thank you. Appreciate it. Orkin, go ahead. I know we are short on time, so maybe I should, uh, you know, curb it uh, very, I mean, speak very succinctly. Great project, uh, but as any mentioned, there, the didactic dimension starts to overshadow the criticality. When, when you start to provide a user manual to your video, to your project, it becomes a little bit, you know, like, okay, who's the audience? What, what is the work? Like, is the work, the, the project is the work, the explanation. So for uh, a comment and a question, uh, is there a third way you can imagine the project that will make us think about the invasive species problem in quotations differently? as opposed to killing them, as opposed to seeing there's a solution and so on. So is, can you point towards a different place where we can think with your project differently as opposed to you know, giving us instructions that, oh, you have to think of this in this particular way? Um, like, like Dominic spoke to earlier, uh, we, we had like ideas of how we could kind of combine the two and make it more of a middle ground. Um, although with the time constraints uh, of the semester ending, and us uh, working on it afterwards, we just, we, we didn't have time to uh, completely redo the project and take a different look at it. Um, so we decided to uh, ex like go ahead and finish off and do better on the second half of it to explain it a little better in what we were going for. And the first half was more of a, to kind of get people involved that oftentimes wouldn't even normally think about it. Um, it doesn't directly affect most people's uh, noticeably day-to-day -day lives and a lot of people wouldn't think about it so we tried to make it as entertaining as possible in the beginning to get them on board and then uh we we tried to round it off with the ending explanation if i could add to that very quickly uh i think we noticed that other projects in the past and they're still being made very good projects that sort of present these direct alternatives um that we could use for invasive species management, whether it be zebra glass from uh, a couple of years ago at the Biodesign Challenge or things like that. So uh, we kind of went for the alternative approach, a sort of educational, but also a critical approach. Thank you for your question. Great answer. All right, uh, we're gonna move forward. Nice job, Ball State. Uh, our next project, our next video is from the University of Sydney. Hi, I'm a weird design computing, computing student from the University of Sydney. Sydney. Our project, titled My Heal Smart Insoles, focuses on Australia and how foot-related diseases are prevalent here. Foot ulcers are one of the most severe forms of foot-related disease, and they can be caused by a range of often interrelated diseases such as diabetes, vascular disease, and peripheral neuropathy which is the loss of feeling of the nerves in a person's extremities. 
Foot ulcers require timely intervention because if left untreated, they can ultimately lead to foot amputations. And diabetic patients with foot ulcers have a high rate of morbidity, on par with aggressive forms of cancer. Each year in Australia, there are more than 4,400 amputations resulting from diabetes, and this is the second highest rate in the developed world. By addressing this problem, we could help the health system save approximately $2.7 billion over a five-year period. Our team conducted interviews with several health professionals, including Brisbane-based GP Leonard King, who visited Vanuatu in 2012, where he observed high rates of central obesity. From this, our team conducted further research and discovered that islands in the South Pacific region have some of the highest rates of diabetes in the world, and often people living here have limited or no access to foot health care aid. With this in mind, our team aimed to create a sustainable foot health product that could be sent overseas to assist in these developing nations. We conducted and evaluated interviews with both patients and healthcare workers to develop three different personas, Healthy Hillary, Caring Karen and Resilient Robert. Caring Karen is a 40-year-old allied health professional working at Vanuatu Hospital who wants to find a sustainable solution to help her diabetic patients look after their feet. My Heal is a mycelium-based smart insole Mycelium is the vegetative part of a fungus or fungus-like bacterial colony, consisting of a mass of branching thread-like hyphae. Mycelium has been used in a range of biodesign products because it is a highly durable and fast-growing material, and it could potentially be used to transform the shoe design industry. Our project will effectively help to address two wicked problems currently at stake, providing universal healthcare for all and tackling the problem of waste. In our user journey map, Karen Karen orders a pair of My Heal Smart insoles to use for her patients at Vanuatu Hospital. She wanted a cost-effective and environmentally sustainable device that would help her patients manage and improve their foot health as well as save her island from the effects of climate change and rising sea levels. Karen liked how accessible it was for the overseas users but was concerned that it was too difficult for her patients to put together themselves. To overcome this issue, My Heal will partner with healthcare professionals to facilitate and assist with growing and provide an extensive step-by-step -step process within the kit and on the My Heal website. Karen was most impressed with the lack of plastic waste within the growing process, helping to give orthotic access to remote users. She was also concerned that some patients will either not have a phone or lack the ability to work on it properly. So to overcome this issue, the user's account can be linked to and monitored by a volunteer medical professional. This is great because she can monitor them remotely and suggest exercises for them to complete based on the problem detected with the sensors. Once the insole is broken and needs replacing, they can compost the mycelium base and recycle the sensors for the next insole. The final product, My Heal Project, responds effectively to the design challenge of ensuring healthy lives and well-being for all people at all ages, in accordance with the United Nations Sustainable Development Goal of 2030. This eco-friendly podiatry product helps increase awareness and encourages early intervention for people at risk of developing foot-related problems such as ulcerations. The team has considered both the needs of potential users and healthcare professionals who will be using the design to develop an accessible, user-friendly and cost-effective prototype. The assets that make up MyHeal include packaging of the Grow It Yourself kit, the online MyHeal app, the feather casing and our website. The My Heal Grow It Yourself kit can be purchased on the My Heal website. The kit will hold everything that you need to grow your own My Heal Smart Insole at home. Within contains a laser cut cardboard model that can be assembled to the basis of the grown insole structure, mycelium spawn and materials for growing, pressure sensor, a microcontroller and case, as well as step-by-step -step visual instructions detailing how the user can grow the My Heal at home. Within the kit will be a microcontroller and a specially designed casing. This will clip to the top of the user's shoe via the laces. The base is curved to fit comfortably to the bridge of the user's foot so that they can run, walk, play comfortably without the device falling off. The data is accessed on the MyHeal app. Here there is both the patient and the healthcare worker login to access the insole data. The patient will receive warning of the problem areas and exercise notifications from the app or their designated healthcare professional. This data can also be reached and presented visually through the app including heat maps and graphs with additional information on their condition. This solution was tested against persona-based storyboards, hero stories, a user journey map, then proposed to biologist Megan Chai, computer scientist Anusha Withen, and biodesign lecturer Philip Goh. For further refinement, both of the growing process 
and technology required to develop the My Heel Smart Insole. We first collected blackwood from the DMAF labs. In a lumber yard, 45% is usable material, 35% is sawdust, and 20% are waste chips. Blackwood is the 55% of unusable waste which we collected for our design. This blackwood is riddled with mould sports which can affect the growing process. To counteract this risk, the wood is wet and left overnight to be pasteurised with sugarcane and wheat straw so that native microbes can stop the breakdown. To do so, the mix is placed into an autoclave where it reaches 120 degrees for 15 minutes at high pressure. The aircon is turned off a day in advance to minimise the mould contamination and allow the spores to settle. The blackwood and straw are then blended into a food processor to make the mix thinner. 10% nitrogen supplement and 10% oyster mushroom spawn is then added and mixed with the blackwood and straw. The moulds are then wrapped in sterilised cling wrap for the mix to be placed into and compressed. The filled moulds are then put into a temperature controlled room that monitors the CO2 and humidity levels to grow for a week. After this, the insole is removed from the mould to be dried out in an oven for 3 hours at 50 degrees. Once dried out, the insole is ready to be worn. The technology of My Heel is compact yet robust and easily accessible. It consists of an NRF52840 feather microcontroller which harnesses the power of Bluetooth Low Energy, or BLE, to transmit the collected data to a computer or smart device to be interpreted and visualised. The key elements of this array of electronics really consist of two paper-thin pressure sensors embedded in the mycelium, which provide an accurate data feed representing the user's weight on their feet and particular spots of the foot where the weight is not evenly distributed. In the conceptual phase of the product, there are two consumer-grade pressure sensors which have their signal augmented and mapped by a non-inverting op-amp circuit running back into the microcontroller. But future iterations are hoped to include a bespoke, flexible printed circuit boards which can be easily swapped between mycelium housings when necessary. The data link between the MyHeel and the user's device will be established over Bluetooth and will be a consistent flow of data to be stored. This is made possible by the aforementioned BLE connection which has the capability to consistently transmit data using minimal power from the integrated battery cell. The board being used currently is powered by a small lithium-ion battery. This type of battery is easily accessible, cheap and safe to use in embedded applications and the board also manages charge and discharge of this cell. This concept is heavily benefited by the recent explosive growth of hobby electronics and this has led to massive advancements in the technology, allowing applications like this to be small, integratable and cheap. The circuitry of the pressure sensor has been iterated upon multiple times and is still in development to make sure it will be compact and also serve its destined purpose when mounted to a shoe. Further, rigorous and broad user testing was conducted to capture the general public's view with regards to the product in order to determine avenues for further design iterations. This was conducted in the form of semi-structured interviews and think-alouds. Users were asked questions in relation to their demographic and also their personal experiences with their own foot health and are then asked to interact with a paper prototype of the app. This revealed findings such as how younger generations have had limited interaction with their foot health because it doesn't seem like an issue, and I've never had any problems in the past. Overall, the application was received well, with older people commenting on the simpleness and how it was straightforward and to the point and not cluttered. I love my My Heel Smart Insoles as a great idea for the environment. It'll be really positive for developing communities and countries. The instance of diabetic complications such as femur amputations can be reduced. Once use cases were described, the interviewees agreed that overall they believed it would be valuable to potential users with foot problems, but also had the potential to revolutionise foot mindfulness and promote an eco-friendly method of early detection of foot problems. In terms of feasibility, there are many mycelium-based products used in design, including as an alternative to phone packaging, in furniture design and in architectural design, specifically for our project. And a team at Delaware University has developed a similar project using mycelium as the basis of sandals. The MyHeel Smart Insoles extend on this current research into mycelium-grown shoes, and they stand apart from other plastic and carbon fibre smart insoles on the market because they are biodegradable with reusable microprocessors. They can be grown at home, they are relatively cheap, and they consider the needs of both the user and healthcare professionals. Our current prototype is designed with a flat upper surface. In future, the MyHeel team would like to develop a more advanced laser cut mould so that the mycelium can be grown to provide customised arch support for each individual user. All right, and we're back. Thank you, University of Sydney. Do we have any questions from the judges? Yes, Hemi, please take it away. Thank you. Really interesting presentation. Um, I have two questions. One, just out of ignorance, really, what is the sort of actionability? What happens when someone gets this 
sensor information? How, do, how was there a, an algorithm that reports that something's wrong? Is there what is the action? And I guess the second thing is I was uncertain about the I guess the synergy between what I saw as sort of two very different technologies coming together. It seemed to me a worthy goal to create mycelial-based insoles because we obviously have a lot of you know, issues with the current materials and, and so on. And then it seemed like a, a, a potentially worthy goal of, of anal, um, analyzing or having a monitor of foot health. It wasn't clear to me that there was a sort of synergy of putting those two, th just discuss that. Um, I think in terms of your first question, so in terms of the um, all the technology merging together, so what will happen is the so there's a, a range of sensors on the top of the mycelium, and that will detect. So there'll be a, a based on a pressure. If it goes over that, it'll send an alert. And so that'll go straight to your phone. Well, it'll connect to the feather, which is attached to the shoe. And then that'll send it to your phone, which will be logged into a personal account. That is something that can also be reached by a podiatrist or a healthcare professional that they designate it to. So they can monitor it themselves or because to save the podiatrist from going on there, because they have to go down, do a lot of bending, a lot of things that um, affect their health as well to monitor some a patient's foot. By doing, by allowing them to see this and see early symptoms that can minimise their effect, effect on them and just help it before it gets to a stage where they do have to take that next step, where they have to get an amputation or something that they don't want to do. So recognising it early and having an early uh, um, solution, it, whether that's just changing your shoe, changing your insole, something like that, something simple that will save them thousands of dollars in the end. So that's um, the integration of the um, technology, yeah. <laughs> Let's go to him. <laughs> Hank, go ahead. Ah, okay. Um, so clever idea. Uh, I'm just curious, do you expect, did you see any signs of consumer resistance to the idea of putting fungus in their shoes? I mean, feed and oh. fungus go, go together yeah, in various we unpleasant the, ways. When we made the logo, I was like, oh, foot fungus. Like that's the first thing I thought of. But when people saw it, they were like, like really positive about it, I think, because everyone's very conscious of like fashion and like how much that affects the environment. But yeah, I ha I had that initially, but once you see it, it like, you, you don't think of fungus because it's just like, looks like mycelium. Did, yeah. did you have people just actually walking around with them? I'm Luke did, so. Yeah, um, so I, um, I had a standing desk, so I stood on them and walked around my room while working on the assignment. Um, and, it's 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 comfortable like obviously you wear socks with it um but it it's a it's kind of like it's very similar in feel to styrofoam um and so, so it kind of still provides that support and i was um <clears throat> and i think the way we kind of came up with shaping it is um similar to oh, we call them thongs you guys call them flip-flops um don't want to get that mixed up um and they um so they kind of mold over time to your foot and i think the um if you once you feel it it feels dry it feels kind of rough and you, you kind of don't get that that fungus kind of feel like it's not doesn't have that kind of weird feel hmm. interesting thanks awesome naomi please yes um i i love the fact that you guys made you know, the, the, the thing and my serum and everything and I even tried on. Um, but I'm wondering, why should people make their own? The product is make your own shoe sole, right? And that's a bit tricky with the, the, the electronic component have to be positioned in a specific place. And, you know, it might make sense more if a company makes it and then send over, right? But mm -hmm. your product is and make your own so can you tell us a little bit more about why you chose that option like rationale like yeah 
I guess um, in terms of the sensors, I, we wanted to do a make your own thing so you could reuse what you already had instead of them buying um, more components and making it more expensive and just to make it a bit more accessible because we are um, aiming it at the South Pacific sort of regions where diabetes and all that foot sort of problems are a lot more common and they don't have as much, they're not as like wealthy or have as much access to certain things. So by providing them with a grow it yourself kit, when they do have that issue where it breaks, um, they can just grow it yourself, pop the sensors. So there will be like instruction manuals sort of telling them, outlining where to put everything. So it shouldn't be too complex. So, and then once they've like done it once, they can do it multiple times and hopefully it will last longer and be a lot more environmentally friendly in the end as well. Are you envisaging they have to make remake a lot uh, like many times so it's better rather than buying from somewhere they keep growing them like themselves is is that the rationale behind i was talking to a lady yesterday who was from london in the group chat and she was saying like poverty how like you buy a cheap pair of sandals they wear out and then like you keep buying and up and ex spending more than you would if you'd bought the expensive pair so i guess like that is trying to like address that problem of like instead of having to invest in like $500 orthotics it's like that DIY culture and I guess if there's like I, I imagine if it was like my family my dad would do it and then like he would help other people do it like someone who's like techie would be into that kind of thing so yeah thanks all right thank you judges great job team we're going to move on to our last presentation of the day which is RMIT University Take it away, Jeff. Our relationship with the forest has always been an important factor for societal development. Their productive, ecological, social, and cultural functions shape and benefit how we coexist with nature. Yet, in the context of the man-made climate emergency we are now living in, our cultural ties are often overlooked. Before his passing in 2002, the Kakadu elder, Bill Nagy, proposed a different narrative, powerfully described in his book, Story About Feeling. With these words, Bill speaks of a feeling within the body or blood that is tied to the life of the country, describing this connection as the foundation for one's existence. If we lose this connection to country, then do we cease to exist? The recent article, Deforestation and World Population Sustainability, a quantitative analysis, described a very similar concern. As a result of our increasing global population, and economic demands on our forests, 20 million square kilometers of forest have already been lost. Projecting into the future, only civilizations capable of a switch from an economical society to a sort of cultural society in a timely manner may survive. But what does this cultural relationship with a forest look like? And even more importantly, how can we better communicate with one another? In the early 1990s, a group of researchers led by Dr. Suzanne Simard unearthed a pattern of fungi linking manifold tree species. What they found was a type of cooperative internet where carbon and nutrients are being exchanged between trees through mycorrhizal networks. This finding was appropriately coined the Wood Wide Web. In 2020, Researchers focusing on the architecture of the Wood Wide Web ran an experiment with Douglas fir trees in a plot of land of 67 trees in British Columbia, Canada. Here, the researchers took DNA samples from each of the trees within the plot and used a dispersed, non-random sampling approach to identify the paths of connection between the trees. In this study, the tree with the highest degree of connectivity was found to be connected to 47 other trees within the plot. But what are these connections about? Aside from the exchange of nutrients, 
Communication of stress among trees can also be found within the wood wide web in the form of ethylene. Ethylene is a well-known stress hormone in plants and begins synthesis when physical or chemical abiotic stresses like drought or biotic stresses like a pathogen affect the plant's livelihood. Unable to physically escape these stresses, trees instead will warn their neighbours of these dangers, ensuring that the health of the forest ecosystem as a whole is protected. This incredible act of resilience often goes unnoticed, but is a vital aspect of forest communication. To make the invisible visible, we look to collaborate with one of the world's oldest known living fossils, cyanobacteria. In a research article from the University of Tennessee, researchers demonstrated cyanobacteria responding to low levels of ethylene. This is due to the ethylene receptor SYNETR1 contained in the cyanobacteria Synecocystis. This receptor is responsible for regulating the cell surface and extracellular components, leading to alteration in phototaxis and biofilm formation. The research team found that even the lowest concentration of 8 nanoliters resulted in faster phototaxis since more filaments of cells moved into the illuminated area of the plate than were observed in ethylene-free air. This movement of the bacteria, when exposed to ethylene, was often characterized as finger-like projections of cells moving as a group. By contrast, treatment with 700 nanoliters of ethylene caused the cells to form a distinct band around the edge of the illuminated area, reminiscent to the ring that formed farther from the light with 1000 nanoliters. Based on these results, the mobility of cyanobacteria was most obvious when the ethylene concentration was between 1 to 100 nanoliters. In our own research, we look to replicate these findings with the additional variable of stressor types. Here, we experimented with four Chamaderea palms, one as our control, and three with varying stresses, including burning, physical attack, and high salinity. The individual plants were then sealed with glass covers to avoid ethylene spreading into the air. After seven days, the ethylene emitted by the three variable plant groups should have affected the phototaxis of cyanobacteria groups which we represented in this image. With Underland, our intention is to augment the life of the separation tree by showcasing the resilience of one of its offspring. Within the Royal Botanic Gardens in Melbourne is the river red gum tree known as the separation tree. This 400 year old tree is one of the few remaining trees that predates European colonization and that has managed to outlive countless events since. Sadly, the separation tree is now dying, but its offspring is alive and well. Underland is a sculpture expression of this tree's resilience. Located on the nearby Tennyson lawn is one offspring of this historic tree. It is here that we hope to bring into view the future of this ancient tree, as a reminder to our civilization to listen and to respect the voices of all life on this planet. The sculpture itself consists of several components, a sliced cyanobacterial reactor, a cyanobacterial reaction tank, a nutritive solution circulation system, an ethylene circulation system, a data receiver, and a tree sensor. These components interact when the tree sensor detects the climatic conditions around the river red gum tree and sends the corresponding data to a receiver at the base of the sculpture. A similar concentration of ethylene is then injected into the sculpture, along with a nutritive solution to provide a steady flow of information. While in the sculpture, cyanobacteria will begin to move in response to the ethylene levels, and, as sunlight also interacts with the sculpture, the bacteria will gradually move towards the outer edges of the sculpture's slices. After a few days in the sculpture, the bacteria will have likely reached the edge of the slices, Viewing the bacteria from above, we imagine the patterns that emerge to be like finger-like projections as described in our research. 
Yet, each pattern that is created will have its own meaning, linked to the environmental and non-environmental conditions the tree is experiencing. In our design, we have simulated four of the most typical environmental conditions happening in Melbourne that both the tree and our audience could experience. Floods, heat waves, high winds, and cold snaps speculatively represented through the following concentrations of 8, 70, 700, and 1000 nanoliters of ethylene. For example, floods or heat waves are detected around the site, then concentrations of 8 or 70 nanoliters of ethylene will be injected into the sculpture. These lower concentrations of ethylene encourage the fastest mobility of the bacteria. With mild weather conditions, like high winds or cold snaps, higher concentrations of ethylene leave less finger-like patterns and mobilize the bacteria to the outer edge of the slices, making the sculpture appear greener than usual. With Underland, our intention is to augment the life of the separation tree and showcase its resilience as well as the resilience of its offspring. By visualizing the invisible, we created an immersive experience that could bring man and nature closer to one another. Responding to the site surrounding the tree, we paved a journey from the young gum tree down to the underland sculpture, tying the two lives together. Glazed tier seating surrounding the sculpture provides places for rest and reflection. Seated under the sculpture and above the pool of cyanobacteria, this place of rest brings focus to the present. Life here is magnified and given importance over the distant urban hum. Look more closely and you will see in each slice of this tree-like form, life. The life of cyanobacteria responding and moving to the conditions felt by the tree. The same weather conditions you are experiencing as you sit alongside. It is through this shared experience at Underland that we hope to shift the viewer's perception of nature. Nature is you, and you are her too. When you sit here, and you feel the wind, the heat, and the cold, this tree, and the country around, feels it too. If we are to develop a humanistic relationship with our forests, we need to recognize that we are part of the same life source. Through feeling, we may find that we share more in common than we once thought. All right, nice job, RMIT. Let's um, go right into question from Justin. Thanks guys, that was a really beautiful um, and well-narrated presentation. So I've been culturing microalgae, which is kind of like a uh, cyanobacteria too, for a few years. And I'm not sure that I fully understand the design of the, the bioreactor tank at the bottom and then the slices, like, is it, is, and, and what the purpose is, uh, purposes of each of those things are, is the, are the slices agar, are they, closed vessels containing media. And I also, and then my second question um, is connected to thinking about the, um, the longevity of these kinds of systems. So, you know, when you first um, subculture or impregnate the system with some algae at a low density where, where all the nutrients are, you've supplied them, as they kind of grow, they become dense and denser, they use all of the nutrients. How then would you maintain it once it becomes overly dense, you know, probably in a couple of days or yeah. So have you thought about the kind of system from a longer term perspective than just that initial um, installation and, and reaction? Yeah, uh, actually I'm the science guy in this team, but uh, I'm not really from the scientist background, but I'm trying to answer this question. So yeah, uh, uh, actually the slices, uh, actually the whole project we were trying to do is to mimic the, uh, the nature principle and we also adopt the aesthetic uh aesthetic way to you know uh, try to stimulate the whole process of it so yeah the 
the slices you see in the sculpture is an installation to visualize the uh, uh, send of phototaxis in a way to show the environmental stresses that the trees are feeling uh, at the same time. So the slices is more like the petri dish uh, when you saw in the experiment part. So the sand erection tank actually is kind of a storage tank. You know, uh, when we are maintaining the, the sculpture, uh, we are trying to also control the population of the cyanobacteria because we want to avoid the uh, algae bloom happens. So uh, we renew, we, we introduced the renew strategy. So we replace the water living condition inside the sculpture every four days. So uh, then the liquid would come into the reaction tank on the, on the ground. And then we could also decay, decay the tank and, and then uh, evaporate the ethylene gas. And then we could recycle the excess population of the bacteria and, and use it as like the bio fertilizer, something like that. So that's how we manage the whole system and keep the balance of the cyanobacteria population. Can I also add something about why we choose this form, this shape of this sculpture, like slide? Because this shape of this sculpture is like a upshot, a uh, reverse loot, and it grows into a sky, as you can see. So it represents the life force, both the life force of nature and the, the life force of culture. Uh, in addition, we divided the slide into many slides, as you can see, um, because uh, through the gap of each slide, the viewers can see the trees and the sculpture itself is a mapping, is a reflection of the trees, which look silent, but so alive, actually. Yeah, no, I think the aesthetics you've nailed and I understand that, but I think there might be some scientific technicalities you would actually have to go and test um, to, to actually falsify some of your hypotheses, but yeah, nice job. All right, uh, Orkan, please go ahead. Um, I also admired the video, very nice idea. It made me think about like the early modern ideas of uh, building aquariums and zoos, you know, when humans had all the uh, nice intentions to communicate what's happening in the world, uh, to the animal world, and then the plants and all these things. So uh, this is a new kind of modern uh, algae aquarium that is telling a very fascinating story. But if you think about, it's still about telling the human problem to the humans without thinking too much from the perspective of the organisms, right? A lot of algae is going to live and die in the system uh, just to tell one amazing message to the humans. But is this, is this the right method? Is this the right installation? Is, is it the right idea to convey this very poetic message to the humans? I mean, can you think about any other forms where this mapping could be even more simplified. This whole thing doesn't have to be a massive installation that needs to be, uh, you know, uh, very expensively built and maintained. Uh, did you go through other other ideas before you end up with this? Yeah, if it if it's okay, I might take this question. Um, that's a great question. the The overall um, or the overarching idea of this project, I guess, is to start a conversation with nature. Um, and to try to engage with forests in a way where we're bridging a gap of communication to be able to understand perhaps a better way how we can maintain our forests by understanding the feelings of trees. But I think your point on could this sculpture be smaller? Absolutely. And the sight and scale of it uh, could be flexible, could be adjusted to different cities all over the world. We took Melbourne as our context and I think you're right in terms of is it appropriate to be using these organisms just to communicate a message um, that's kind of an ethical question that's debatable for sure but in terms of where we are in society right now I think we need to start the conversation at least um, and it, it, it's a debatable topic as to whether it's right or wrong, but I think our intention was to at least try to speculatively start this conversation. But thank you for your question. It's a great. No, thank you. Good answer. Um, Naomi, we'll finish up with you, please. And uh, make sure you unmute yourself. 
it's very late here. <laughs> so um, uh, thank you very much. A beautiful uh, presentation and uh, that thoughtful, you know, uh, Q and A. I want to follow up on that. Um, one design feature of your project is bugging me a little bit, um, especially because you were saying this illustration is to understand what the tree is experiencing uh, in a much more sort of a relatable way for human. Um, why did you then didn't didn't you make the, the illustration react to the accident produced by the dying tree? You actually kind of uh, made it very indirect. You know, you measure the ethylene that tree is uh, producing, and then you actually produce the ethylene. You know, that's quite artificial, right? Like, could could you did you think about kind of directly linking that, that, or why did you make that this design decision? Maybe that's my question. Well, uh, actually, it is hard to, you know, uh, directly use the ethylene release by the trees because, you know, the, the environmental uh, condition is kind of complicated. So I would like to say, actually, the role of ethylene in our project is more like uh, a trigger. So in the whole process, the ethylene you know, uh, with the ethylene, then the whole process could start. So we could like to see it as a, a really significant signal. So we want to amplify this kind of signal and, and to show the trees experience in a way. So we, we just stimulate the experience that uh, the University of Tennessee Research Group, they did. And then we use the digital technology to amplify this kind of signal, and you know, uh, trying to trying to create a really obvious pattern that could read by by our audience, so that they could you know uh, understand the meanings of this kind of sound of bacteria phototaxis in a way. Yeah. Needed to amplify. Yeah. Okay. Right. Thanks. If I can add to that, um, we did initially try to use the ethylene directly from the tree. Um, but what we found was that there's a sort of a different time scale to nature. And perhaps for our audience coming or seeing um, this changing cyanobacteria creating patterns, it would be at a much slower scale to the pace of life that we're used to. So we tried to you know, amplify, as Shan Shan said, just to, in a way, make it more engaging as a community piece as well. Yeah, and I think maybe uh, in the future we can kind of design a box or container at the root of the tree to, to gather or to collect these at the links that are released by tree and send to our sculpture. And that can be um, directly used, the, the data or something that produced the directly by the tree. Yeah. Yeah. By the way, that's a quite a good question. All right. Nice job, team. And thank you, judges. Uh, Alex, do you want to join me for this ending? And everyone else, you're, you're welcome to turn your videos off. Thank you so much. Hello. Hey. <laughs> All right. That was a good day of projects. Wonderful job, everyone. Um, Give me one second. Okay, great. Uh, we are done for the day. Uh, that was that was an incredible day of projects. Um, we are day two of three. So we have one more day tomorrow where we'll be showing um, several more student projects. Um, we're going to start that live stream at 8 a.m. Eastern New York time uh, tomorrow morning for us. Um, and yeah, like uh, until then, we hope you'll still continue to um, uh, add, contribute, add to our Miro board, our community Miro board, and uh, keep 
showing showing up on social media and tagging us and uh, using the hashtag BDC2021. Um, and lastly, of course, not lastly, but lastly for me, uh, we have the Community Choice Prize as well. So if you want, if you saw any um, projects today or yesterday that you got really excited about that you want to um, give some points to, um, we hope you'll fill out our community um, prize nomination um, um, form. Um, and we will announce that winner this this Friday at, at our award ceremony. Um, Alex, anything else to say? Um, first, congratulations, students. Thank you so much for being with us. Judges, thank you for being with us. Audience members, thank you for being with us. Um, it's always a pleasure to see these incredible minds and how they envision the future. Uh, it's the end of the day, so I'll keep it short. Uh, I know you've been hearing us say this often, and you've probably seen our video. We're publishing our first book and we're super excited. It's a retrospective of the last five years of biodesign projects. There's over a hundred voices and projects in there from our community that we're super excited to share with everyone. I hope you check out the Kickstarter page where you can buy a book, uh, you can pre-order a book. Uh, you can get some cool digital rewards like a crossword puzzle and a fun playlist uh, curated by our team. Uh, and Thank you everyone who has already pledged. We are two thirds of the way to our goal. Your support means the world to us. We're so excited. Uh, and I hope you all join us again for BDC day three tomorrow morning at 8 a.m. Thanks again. Bye everybody. Bye. Bye.